Good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you are in. Uh, we welcome you uh, to this first Asian EUS group webinar on interventional EUS. I um, thank all of you who have uh, joined this meeting. We have had uh, excellent response about 660 um, endoscopists, endosonographers, some of them are very senior and highly respected, have uh, joined this meeting with us. And this is actually bigger than any of the meetings that I have ever conducted. Uh, and I can tell you, I have attended, I have done some big meetings in the past. So this is great. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your time uh, with us. Um, we have 52 countries represented today in this webinar and uh, I have a list of all the people who are here but uh, I, I don't think I'll be taking each one's name but I do want to quickly go through the names of the countries um, that are present today in this uh, webinar so just give me a quick one minute. So we have uh, number one, Colombia. Um, we have Professor Lazaro Arango with us. Uh, um, thank you very much to Professor Lazaro and uh, to the ASED for helping us out with this. We have lots of representation from Colombia and from South America because of your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lazaro. Uh, a quick list, Algeria, Argentina, Australia, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Brazil, Cambodia, Canada, Chile, China, Mexico, Ecuador, Egypt, France, Greece, Hong Kong, Hungary, India. India has the largest representation, of course. Indonesia, Iraq, Italy, Japan. Japan has a big representation. Korea, Malaysia, Mexico, lots of people from Mexico. Morocco, Myanmar, Netherlands, Nepal, Nicaragua, Norway. Pakistan, Peru, Philippines, <laughs> Poland, Qatar, <laughs> Romania, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Spain, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Thailand. Thailand has a big contingent. Uh -oh. program meeting uh, mm -hmm. it's a very very um, focused subject eus guided gastroenterostomy but i'm happy uh, that you are here and i know you are here because of the faculty that we have with us uh, these are all uh, very very respected and renowned people who have done a lot of work in this field. So may I introduce um, our faculty who will be helping us today. First of all, Professor Takao Itoi is with us from Medical University of Tokyo. Um, hi Takao, welcome to the meeting. Uh, Takao is, uh, you, I, I don't have to tell anything about uh, Professor Itoi. Uh, he published a very significant paper in the gut on the e pass technique and not only he was guided in gastroenterostomy, but he has published in a large number of other areas pertaining to He was Anthony Tio from the Chinese University of uh, Hong Kong with us. Hi, Anthony. Um, uh, Anthony, uh, Anthony has been uh, uh, publishing furiously on all topics, including DJ, and he um has um he has you know got a sort of reputation for being a very very scientific mind analytical mind so um the, uh, the topic that we have given anthony reflects uh, that we have two other uh, friends colleagues who will be joining us uh, professor muin kashab he is uh, uh, from John Swap uh, has published uh, a comparative trial. Hi, Moin. Moin is here. So he has, he has published a comparative study uh, of USCJ and enteral strength. We would like to hear from him his technique. And then 
Uh, we uh, have Professor uh, M.P. Miranda. He will be joining us soon from Valladolid, University of Valladolid, Spain, who again has done big work in EUS guided gastroenterostomy and study and published comparative uh, trials. Uh, so now, uh, before we um, start uh, with Muin's lecture, uh, I will just give you the format of what is going on now what we are going to do in the next few hours uh, so this is a monothematic uh, webinar on uh, management of gastric outlet obstruction with uh, the lumen opposing metal stents we will also discuss the other modalities enteral stents a little bit of surgical gj uh, which technique is better uh, we have multiple techniques for you to see. Um, each uh, has their own technique of how to do a surgical gastroenterostomy. And then how does it compare it with other ex existing techniques? Anthony will be telling us that. So we learned the various techniques. We understand the current data. And the format is we will have lectures. So the lectures will be 20 to 25 minutes followed by questions. So I would request you to type your questions in the Q&A. You will see Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just click on that and type your question. Please ask a lot of questions. Some of our uh, panelists are very busy, so they may not be available afterwards. So please ask questions immediately after their lecture, if possible. Uh, so Q&A, then there will be to after the lectures end by Professor Miranda and at the end we will have a few questions on the live demonstrations also. So without much ado, welcome you all of us, all of you again. Uh, I will ask Muin to start his lecture on how I do EOS guided gastroenterostomy. Muin. Okay, great. Uh, can you guys hear me well and see me well? Yes. Okay, and you have this full screen, right? Yes. Okay, excellent. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Vinay, for inviting me. Uh, this is a great symposium, and the focus topic uh, is, is, a, is a great idea. So congratulations. Uh, I'll be, uh, after, after my lecture, you know, I'm very interested in this topic, so I'll be in and out uh, between, my, uh, between my endoscopy. Uh, so I have two cases to show. These are live cases. So, um, so that way we'll show you how we do it in real life. Uh, and, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, questions after, after each case. Uh, Vinay, if you feel I have to stop, pause during the video, please let me know and I'll pause and I'll take questions. Sure, uh, sure, sure. So this is a uh, case that I did uh, last year in, uh, in Milan. Uh, it's a patient with ampullary adenocarcinoma. Uh, he's had multiple chemotherapy sessions. Uh, CT showed disease progression, and the, they tried to do a duodenal stent, and it was unsuccessful. So I start with the patient on their back, under fluoroscopy, and here's our gastroscope situated just proximal to the obstruction. So if, the, if it's at D1, D2 here, we're just in the duodenal bulb, and there we see the, uh, the biliary stent. So now we're using a 60 cc syringe and we'll inject contrast. We're not putting any air. And now under fluoroscopy, you wanna make sure the contrast is going the right direction. Nothing is coming back up. So after we fill the small bowel, we know it's good. We give glucagon. We want to give a, um, a small bowel paralytic so that this dye stays in the small bowel and it actually does. I like to inject about a total of 500 cc's. It's a mix of saline, contrast, and methylene blue. Here you see some methylene blue uh, combined with contrast. The idea is to distend the small bowel as much as we can, push the air out, and have a dilated small bowel loop very close to the stomach. You see this, this scope here is looped in the stomach. So do you know this is the stomach here? And we know we're gonna have nice dilated loops uh, close to the uh, uh, tip of the EUS scope when we place it. So here I'm continuing to inject and looking at the small bowel. Here's some 
a little more contrast. So if we're injecting saline, you know, I mix them with saline, etc. I like saline instead of water so that we don't cause hyponatremia. So again, a total of um, eight to 10 syringes. So that's about 400 to, six to 500 uh, cc's. I like to dilate multiple small bowel loops. That gives me more options to target with uh, the EUS scope. Once we feel we're good, you know, I, I give a milligram of glucagon before I start injecting. And then I give another milligram when I'm changing scopes. Because you know, we have to remove the EGD scope and put the uh, EUS scope. So here I'm being a little, even more generous than usual with the, with the contrast. I think we have adequate uh, dilation. So here we're pulling the gastroscope out. So your team has to be ready. So we can't now go get the EUS scope you know, from, from storage. The EUS scope has to be ready. You see the stomach clean before you start your endoscopy. You, know, you have to clean the stomach if there's any food debris. If any of the contrast material came to the fundus, also that has to be suctioned. And that's why initially when we look with fluoroscopy, you want to make sure most of the contrast is going, going forward and not coming backward. You don't want to spend 15 minutes suctioning contrast uh, uh, from, uh, from the stomach. So now this is the EUS scope that was already, uh, that was ready. We're going to push it down to the stomach and we want to approach one of the dilated bowel loops under fluoroscopy. And sometimes you actually can indent, so touch the, bowel, the small bowel loop with the scope. If you move it, once it moves, you know it's you're just, you're indenting it, you're right there. But most more importantly is use fluoroscopy to direct your scope towards a dilated small bowel loop. Like that, so turn the other way, here you go. And now once we're like this, we turn into our EOS vision. And, and look for a dilated small bowel loop. So uniformly, you're gonna have a dilated small bowel loop close to the stomach. That's a little harder in patients with upper surgical anatomy, but with standard anatomy, you're always gonna find a loop of stomach uh, dilated and close to, uh, sorry, loop of small bowel close to the stomach. So of course we wanna use Doppler to make sure there are no major intervening vessels. Small vessels are okay, vessels a little far are okay. So, but you, gotta, but you wanna be careful. Even if there's like a vessel like you see here, there's a vessel there. So it's okay to go next to it, but you gotta, gotta be careful if you, uh, not to dilate the stent at the end. If you dilate the stent at the end, you're gonna shear that vessel. So here's the technique I follow. This is a 19 gauge needle and I call it the finder needle. So now we wanna puncture the small bowel loop with a 19 gauge needle and apply suction and, and make sure we're gonna get blue dye. Once you get blue dye, you know this is the jejunum and not the colon. So there, are, there have been reports of inadvertent gastrocolostomy. So this is an easy step, it takes two minutes, and, and that way uh, we ensure we have the right target. The transverse colon is right there where we're working. So you have, you may puncture a dilated fluid filled transverse colon without knowing. So in my opinion, this finder needle technique is essential. So now we have a 15 millimeter or 20 millimeter hot axis. This is the direct technique so we don't, we don't push a wire. So if you push a wire now, it tends to push the small bowel loop away from the stomach wall. So make sure the stent is secured well on the scope. You don't want it to be wobbly in the middle of the procedure. Sometimes it takes some work to secure, uh, to secure it at the hub. And now we're continuing, we, we continue to look at the same bowel loop to make sure we're not changing vision. And now we are perpendicular to the jejunum. Very important, we don't wanna go tangential. So everything is ready. And now it's a slow puncture using heat. This is not an FNA. We don't want to push the small bowel away from us. Let the heat find its way into the small bowel. It's an excellent, uh, you know, the, the cautery tip is really excellent and smooth. It goes very nicely. But if you jab it, you're going to push it away. So now we're, we, uh, this is a 15 millimeter axis. 
we deployed the first flange in the small bowel under EUS. We pulled it a little bit to oppose the small bowel loop to the stomach. Now we deploy the second flange in the, in the scope. And now will be the only time where we switch to endovision. So once we switch to endovision, you wanna back the scope away, a little away from the stomach wall to give space for the second flange to open up in the stomach. So you kind of exchange a little, back up the scope, push the sheath out, back up the scope, we should push the sheath, sheath out. And now you see the stent, once you see it, you just push it out and it deploys. Once you see this blue dye, it ensures you that you are in the right place uh, getting like a uh, just a contrast uh, contrast study. Uh, we give one dose of antibiotics before the procedure. These patients do not need antibiotics. I do not dilate the stent. The stent within 24 hours dilate. Um, uh, I've had issues with dilating the stent. There's really no rush. What we do is uh, these patients are not nil by mouth. The first day we admit them to the hospital. The second day, they're on a liquid diet. If they tolerate that, we advance to a low residue, low roughage diet, and they go home on that. Um, we've ha we have some experience with a 20 millimeter stent. Uh, the way I think about it now, if, if I have a nice dilated small bowel loop, I'm comfortable going with the 20. If it is not that dilated, there's, it's not perfect, I use the 15. But we've noticed that the 15 actually, the, patient is, the patients are able to tolerate almost a normal uh, low residue diet. Uh, and we send them home, um, not on antibiotics, we tell them advance to a, like a, almost a normal diet and, uh, and really that's it. Um, doesn't affect, uh, you know, if the patient was on chemotherapy, we ask them to restart chemotherapy in a couple of days. Uh, you know, there is no peritoneal contamination, seeding or anything like that. Um, so that's, uh, that's the technique I use uh, Vinite. Vinay, your phone. I can't hear your microphone. you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, microphone. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, uh, Muin, can you hear me now? Yes. And I do have another video if needed, as, as I said. No, no. Of course, it is needed. Our questions have already started coming. So, I think what you do is show your second video, and then we yeah. will take all the questions together. So please go ahead with the second case. Okay, the second case, uh, do you guys have it now? Can, can you see the case? Yep, yep. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, uh, so here we're just gonna uh, mm -hmm. make it a little faster. So this is a patient with uh, a duodenal stent that's obstructed, advanced pancreatic cancer. Just gonna make it a little faster. And here's the stent. So we're able to reach uh, the proximal aspect of the stent. And uh, we inject here through the stent. So glucagon, as I mentioned, um, and filling the small bowel with contrast and methylene blue and saline under fluoroscopy. Uh, generous infusion. This is the methylene blue. And then quick pulling of the EGD scope, suctioning any fluid there so that it doesn't confuse you during the procedure. And now this is the finder needle in a dilated jejunal loop. See how nicely dilated and close to the stomach it is. You actually have multiple options here. Usually you do. And now you have the hot axis perpendicular to the jejunum. Slow push, not a jab, using cautery to find and push it all the way in. Deploy the first flange. Pull the genome towards the stomach. Switch into end of view here after deploying the second flange. So 
So we see this small uh, view here, endo. So hopefully we'll start to see the uh, stent a little bit. So here I'm pushing the axis out of the scope a little bit while pulling my scope away from the, the gastric wall. I want to give space for that flange to open. And now we're seeing the stent a little bit, and then you go ahead and push it out completely, and it opens right away. So here the procedure is done. Uh, we, you don't have to dilate. You don't have to, to do anything. Okay, Vinay, that's it. Uh, Dr. Vinay, you need to unmute your mic. Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? So, uh, Moin, thank you very much. That was a fantastic uh, demonstration. You uh, made the technique look very, very easy indeed. Uh, the questions are there for you uh, from uh, people. Uh, Dr. Siddharth Srivastava wants to ask, how do you follow up these patients? Yeah. Um, so these patients are, um, you know, one day in the hospital, they go home and then on a normal diet, just low roughage. And, um, and uh, we, we see them as we see any other patients. You know, we check on them on what type of diet uh, they are, uh, they are on. There is no need for follow-up endoscopy unless patient has recurrent symptoms. Uh, these patients are followed up with, uh, within our system. You know, this is a big pancreatic biliary center. So every one of these patients is undergoing treatment at our center. So the follow-up scans, follow-up clinic visits, everything is within the system. Uh, so that's uh, very helpful. But we don't uh, do an endoscopy just to follow up on the stent patency. We go with symptoms. Okay, so um, purely by symptoms, uh, no routine follow-up otherwise, once the patient goes home. Yes. Uh, Dr. Girish Balaraju is asking, which place to select for puncture? I mean, yeah. greater curve, antrum, lesser curve. Why not yeah. use a guide wire? So, um, a lot of these people are not doing GJ. So, a uh, little basic questions are understandable. Please. No, these are very good questions. You know, um, yeah, yeah. so the the first with the guide wire, as I mentioned, you know, actually, if you look at uh, multiple papers, including the cow's uh, paper in gut, uh, the cow is here and he can comment on it. He uh, uh, he published a prospective trial of twenty patients. The technical success was in 18. The two technical failures at that time were due to likely wire pushing the jejunum away from the stomach. So you have a very loose peritoneal organ that's very mobile. And when you try to push a wire, you're pushing the jejunum away. I know, you know, when you start, you always feel more secure if you have a wire. But the wire potentially can do more damage than good in this case. And I've actually had one also stent misplaced. And when I reviewed the video, this was exactly the problem. Um, you know, the, the, once you're comfortable, we're using the carrier tip stent, uh, you really have to be comfortable. You know, this is not a 10 centimeter uh, pseudocyst that's fixed. You know, this is not a gallbladder. This is harder. This is a small mobile organ in the, peritone in the peritoneum. So um, once you're comfortable, targeting the small organ with fine movements. So if you're perpendicular to the jejunum and slow push using cautery to access it, that uh, allows you to avoid the use of a guide wire. In terms of where in the stomach, I am not looking uh, endoscopically to see where the stent is, is going to be deployed. This is not gonna be the antrum, you know? Uh, I, I always think the antrum and these axis stents are not friendly to each other. You know, the, the placing a, a lumen opposing stent in the antrum is a big problem. Uh, they get buried, the food impaction. Uh, so GJ does not happen in the antrum. You know, just uh, anatomically, it's usually in, in, the, in the gastric body. But whether it is uh, greater curv curvature, lesser curvature, what I care about is the optimal EUS position. Your scope has to be in a comfortable position. The stomach and the small bowel loop have, a, have to be opposed, and you have to have a perpendicular uh, angle to the small bowel. Uh, you, want, you want to have no chance for misdeployment. 
A question. Great, great. Uh, yeah. Yes, Raja. Question from Ecuador, Dr. Juan Cristobal Rivera. Do you have any experience with the, the hot axis? The hot uh, spaxus, please? Yeah, we, we don't have spaxus uh, in the U.S. Uh, I think uh, the best person to answer is Anthony. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Anthony. Yes. Hot spaxus, yes, I have experience. So um, actually, um, recently they have a new version. So the first version, the punctuality is not as good. Um, but the new version is um, approaching very similar to Axios. So puncturability, I would do a direct puncture with uh, hot spaxes of PFC, gallbladder, maybe even uh, gastrogenostomy. Um, for the stent, I think the um, um, luminal opposing power is still a bit lower for spaxes. Um, again, they are going to have a new version with a higher luminal opposing power. So right now, um, I think I will still, still, still stick to hot axios, but uh, I think in very near future, uh, it may be comparable, two cents. Okay, uh, there's another question. Uh, can we use a non-cautery, that means I think not a hot one, the cold LAMS stent? Uh, Anthony, you can answer that. The, the, the question the about using cold axis or cold spaxes? Oh, okay. I think uh, definitely a uh, hot system is much better because uh, it's a single step uh, procedure. So if you use a cold uh, device, you need to puncture, dilate uh, with cystotome and then balloon. So you end up losing a lot of water from fluids from the small bowel okay. and it becomes uh, uh, undistended. So I think um, definitely a hot system. You know, we, we used the uh, cold, the first publication we, we had in GIE, it was the cold yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. It really yeah. was, it was very tough. Uh, I'll tell you, the procedure was very long and you, you have to dilate the track with the balloon, you know, six millimeters to get the uh, axis down. And when you put, push the axis, because you have to dilate the track and then you have to push cold, you lose vision of the small bowel. The small bowel is not there next to you and when you deploy the first flange, you're praying that's in the small bowel. You know, it's not 100% accurate. So, uh, I mean, I, mean I, I don't think anybody can, should be using the cold to be, uh, to, to, to be honest. Okay. Uh, Muin, one question uh, for you is, uh, uh, what is the diameter of stent you use? Uh, so you already said you prefer a 15 millimeter uh, 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 please expand on it. Why you don't use the yeah. 20 millimeter uh, stain? No, I use the 20. Uh, you know, uh, like huh. this ex last example I showed you, the one, uh, the, the yeah. last example, the small bowel was really dilated and nice and next to the stomach. Uh, it's easy to use the, the 20. When things are not perfect, you know, like uh, some patients, there's a lot of peristalsis, you know, it doesn't dilate as good. Uh, some patients, you know, you, something happened, you couldn't find the loop right away, so uh, it's not as dilated. Uh, but if it's perfect, I use the 20. Uh, you know, the, between the 20 and the 15, you have, I think, 75% increase in, uh, in the surface area, so it's good. Um, so I would, I would advocate for that if you have a good small bowel loop. Have, having said that, it's a little bit more technically challenging. You know, the, the flange is very thick. So you need to have the small bowel has to be dilated because there's a lot of a uh, lot of stent there. It's very thick. You need to have adequate uh, area, the stented area, and the small bowel. And then the, because the 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 flange is is thick, then you have more flange to push out of the scope. You know the uh, when you're using the uh, intra scope deployment technique then you have more sheath in the scope. So even when you push the whole sheath out, sometimes some stent stays in, you have to maneuver your scope, etc. So there is some little bit more dif some difficulty or a little bit more technical challenge. Um, I haven't had an, a, a case where uh, I misdeployed it because of that or failed because of that, but it's just something to, um, to, to think about. Uh, Takao, what's your opinion? 15 versus 20 millimeters? 
So the, basically, I love the, I think uh, bigger is much better. Uh, okay. Like uh, surgical gastrojejunus, of course, uh, I experienced, uh, so uh, I learned that uh, 15, more than 15 cases, uh, one five millimeter axios. Then uh, fortunately, the one case uh, still uh, already uh, six, six years, seven years passed and uh, still, still open. That's why, so yeah, it's okay that even uh, 15, but the bigger, bigger is much better. Big, bigger is better. <laughs> mm. Achha, there are two questions on uh, problems, and I want uh, both of you to answer them. One is what, if, what to do if you puncture the colon accidentally? So has yeah. it happened? And if, if it happens, what to do? Muin? Yeah. Uh, so, so I tell you, if you use the finder needle technique, you're never, that's never going to happen. Uh, if you uh, puncture the colon by mistake and it's a gastrocolostomy, you're going to have to leave it there for four weeks until it matures. And once it matures, then you take the stent out and close it with sutures. Uh, and you can close it with sutures. Uh, but do not try to remove the stent okay. uh, right away. It's not the end of the world. Uh, you know, and you want to instruct the patient just to take liquids, not, uh, not to take uh, solids. Make sure you give PPI so that you're not causing colonic ulceration from the acid. Uh, you know, I would give, um, you know, just keep, keep them on liquids. But uh, uh, it's, it's something you can save. It's, uh, of course, very disappointing and, uh, and not a good thing to have. That's why I think the find the needle uh, is, is, is a must. It's been reported. I haven't had it, but it's been reported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the other question... Maybe, maybe, Anthony, what... maybe Anthony T. you reported it. I don't know. <laughs> Anthony, did you report one? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily not. <laughs> <laughs> so Anthony, now you, you get to answer the next one. So what, what to do if the proximal flange migrates away from the stomach? I guess what, what is meant is suppose it goes inside. I think that happens rarely, but suppose it happens. Yeah, so um, it, it, so it can happen. So in several situations, for example, um, it can happen if you did a direct puncture and then you burn into the small bowel, but uh, you haven't inserted the delivery system deep enough. So when you open the flange, you actually open outside of the uh, small bowel. So in that situation, you have a, hole, a small hole in the small bowel, and then you have a misdeployed uh, distal flange. Another uh, situation is um, you have completely missed your targets, so, but you were not, and then uh, you open the uh, uh, distal flange. In both situations, I would pull out um, the entire system. So uh, if you have just opened your distal flange, um, if you pull out the entire system, um, then you'll have a small hole in the stomach. Um, then you can change your gastroscope to close that hole. Um, with the hole, if, there, if you have a hole in the small bowel, um, I think uh, it's usually okay if you uh, keep the patient uh, near by mouth for uh, one or two days, I think, uh, and give them antibiotics, uh, perhaps, um, and uh, also nasal gastric tube for drainage. Um, usually after a few days of conservative management, I think the small holes should uh, close by um, surrounding momentum or uh, surrounding uh, tissues. So uh, if you have misdeployed the distal flange, um, it's, quite, um, it's quite something that's, that's not desirable, but uh, you have to keep your core and try to pull out the entire system, uh, keep the patient um, conservative management for, for a few days. And then perhaps uh, later on you can uh, do an alternate procedure like your adeno stent or try, if you're brave enough, you can try again, I guess you do Johnson. Uh, um, hey, Vin, uh, hey, Vinay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vinay, so, um, so one, one very important thing like Anthony is mentioning, uh, you, you're gonna have these complications. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it's important to know the different uh, scenarios that Anthony detailed and each one uh, how, how to manage. I'll tell you a quick experience before I leave here, how I've, uh, manage these, and I'm happy to come back later. But they're calling me for for a case. So the if uh, what the most common scenario is one flange in the peritoneum and one flange in the stomach. Okay, so this right. is the most the most common misdeployment scenario. 
uh, this is a, an easy fix. You just have to pull it out, and I, I close the, uh, the uh, gastronomy site with an Ovesco clip. These gastronomy, you know, stomach wall is thick, muscularis propria is thick. It tends to close very fast. So what I do actually before I remove the axis, I put a little clip close to that area so that I, when I go in and easily identify the puncture site and I close it with a clip. And frequently the small bowel contrast is still there so you can reattempt the GJ. So that's, that's one scenario. This, the uh, second scenario is if you, um, if you uh, misdeployed the one flange in the small bowel, the second flange in the peritoneum. That's not uh, a, a good uh, thing to have, but, but and, it, and it's rare. Uh, we've had it with like gallbladders, you know, and stuff like that. So what you can do is with EUS, you can see the axis very well, and you can access its lumen with a 19 gauge needle, put a wire and uh, to the small bowel and bridge with a uh, through the scope stem, like an esophageal through the scope stem. Uh, but the, you can see the axis very well. You can, so basically you're targeting its lumen with EUS. And, and that video, we have a video on, on GIE and GIE describing that. This other scenario where you have a small bowel puncture hole, like, you know, you have a enterotomy. Um, you know, uh, uh, Anthony mentioned, you know, these, some of these patients uh, recover, but, you know, if you have a lot of small bowel fluid in the peritoneum, it gets infected. That's the main problem. Uh, and, and these patients can have loculated fluids, a lot of drains. Uh, it's, it's an issue. So I've had one of those where I did actually peritoneoscopy, you know, with the scope. You have EGD scope there. I, I found the small bowel hole. You can put the axis through that hole, open the flange on, in the small bowel, pull it to the, to the stomach and deploy the second flange. So if you're able to find the hole, it also can be a relatively uh, easy fix. And I also refer to your audience to a GIE video uh, describing uh, that technique. Thanks, Mulin. Thanks a lot. I know you are being called for duty. Uh, I hope you're taking good care of yourself uh, and for your staff. Uh, all the best wishes. Uh, great job. I hope US comes back uh, faster to normal. Uh, I hope you'll come back and join us again whenever you find time. Thank you. Thank I will. you. Thank you very much. I will. Thank you. Thank you all, and good to see you, and good to see everybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Uh, so um, that was a fantastic first uh, lecture and there are lots of questions on the uh, outcomes and which is which technique is better, which technique is not. I think those questions we will field when Anthony comes to give his uh, talk. Uh, the first three talks uh, are on technique. So may I request the questions on techniques. <clears throat> so the next talk is from Professor Takao Itoi, uh, he, he is going to tell us about uh, the E-pass technique, how we do it with the E-pass technique. Uh, Takao. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Takao Itoi in Tokyo. It is uh, 9.15 p.m. here. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to say thank you so much, uh, Binai and the age group, uh, Flora. Uh, for having me uh, in this wonderful webinar. Uh, I, I'm very happy to share this time. Okay, uh, so let's get started. Can you see? Yes. Okay. So, you know, all the people in the world are suffering from COVID-19 now. It was also, this is uh, the Moen's group, uh, Moen's uh, University, John Hopkins Theater. And uh, it was also tough, very tough period in Tokyo. Uh, last couple of months and now the situation is getting better. Uh, nevertheless, we have to provide the endoscopic service for emergent patients, right? So next, uh, I'd like to introduce an interesting protection device shortly before I'm talking my main topic. You know, uh, as you can see, uh, we created a dedicated and a transparent plastic cube for prevention of COVID-19 infection. Disposable glove 
uh, here, disposable globe fit it uh, to uh, fit it to the the endoscopic insertion port here. Very small portion, and the tip of finger of glove is cut here to enable the, the endoscope to advance. This is a, a picture from inside of the cube. To imitate the patient cup, when the endoscope is inserted, experimentally a small balloon containing of fluorescent dye is inflated with air placed in the mouth of the simulated patient here, like this, and they ruptured with the needle devices that pass through the endoscope. Then, we examine the spread of fluorescent dye visualized by ultraviolet light with and without plastic cube. As a result, dye was found on the operator gown, the floor and the globe face face mask, and hat, in case of an, uh, no plastic cube case. In contrast, when we use a plastic cube, the, only the inner surface of the box at the endoscopic insertion post side was contaminated. I think uh, like this kind of, this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, plastic cube is very useful for prevention of the infection. So let's, uh, I'd like to show a small movie. Small movie here. So this is the emergent ERCP cases. So time is limited, I, so I show the short tree. Like this, uh, we are doing, we are doing the emergent ERCP and the interventional US. Okay, let's go back uh, uh, my, to my topics. Gastroid outlet obstruction is often seen in the progress of uh, pancreatic biliary cancers and the gastrojuvenal uh, cancer, uh, usually it's uh, end stage. Nowadays, there are uh, several or survey treatment for GOO. And uh, recently, you know, the US got it, gastrojuvenal gastroenterostomy, Yes, Garrett's uh, so-called anastomosis uh, seems to be one of option. So uh, in this lecture, I'd like to show my, our procedure. I mean, uh, uh, U.S. Garrett double balloon occluded gastrojejunostomy bypass, uh, short ray e pass we call it, which uh, we have developed. Before uh, introducing my, uh, our uh, e pass it is necessary to explain the difficulty of the standard USGJ. There are two big obstacles in this procedure. One is creation of this anastomosis, the other is access to the jejunum. In terms of creation of anastomosis, you know, the uh, lamps uh, made it possible to easily create the anastomosis between two organs. As you know, the inventor of this stent, Kem, Professor Kembimura, has reported the initial animal study uh, of USGJ using a lambs. At that moment, uh, it was deployed from the delivery system with non cautery tip. However, nowadays, fortunately, uh, the lambs with cautery enhanced tip is more uh, safe and reliable. Lambs is available now. So uh, next, uh, access to JGM is the most important and the difficult point in this uh, USGJ. Since theoretically, theoretically, JGM is naturally shrinking, you know, uh, the extension of JGM as a puncture target by some techniques is mandatory, uh, for example, Injecting serine, inflate, balloon, or combination. I've already uh, the moving uh, the showed. So anyhow, uh, nowadays uh, there are several techniques of access to jejunum. 
So namely the transluminal uh, dialect needle puncture to inject the serine water in the jejun or into the luminal injection by ENBD tube, endoscope, or my, our procedure, the double balloon, and or a target balloon technique. So uh, I think uh, there are two important factors for successful and easy access to the jejunum. One is a finding of closer access portion, access site uh, to the jejunum from the stomach. The other is uh, how to keep, how to keep distinction the jejunum sufficiently. It is very important. Regarding ideal uh, access uh, point, to find the access point, you know, the, yeah, as you can see the anatomy, surrounding area of the ligament of the thorax seems to be uh, closer from the stomach. Actually, upper GI graphy, as you can see, shows the shortest distance, shortest distance between the stomach and the jejunum around here, around there. So oh, next, uh, how to keep distinction uh, of the jejunum? It is also very important. So some expertise uh, like uh, Moen, Moen Kashyap, uh, Miss said it is very, very easy. Just uh, inject a large amount of water or serine uh, at once and use a buscopan sometime. Then you can do US guided procedure. But uh, you know, the water easily flows inner side, uh, even using a buscopan. Uh, so, resulting in non distended jejun. Uh, moreover, if contrast medium is used, uh, the peristalsis of a duodenum or jejunum occurs soon. In addition, a lot of a uh, lot of patients have uh, a contraindication of buscopan due to the heart disease, etc. So, uh, in case of a non uh, like this non uh, distended uh, jejunum, pushing the uh, US guide guided devices may make the jejunum shrinking like this leading to mispunctures, misdeployment. In contrast, in case of a well distended jejunum uh, puncture and advancement of a needle or advancement of devices, uh, very, very easier than the non-distended uh, So I, let you know, let you, let, let you know the jejunum uh, distended model, uh, model study. So here is a non-distended model. Uh, in case of a non-distended model, including a standard amount of water uh, in the globe. So you can see, pushing the needle made grow scratched, like this. And the globe is underwater, also, pushing the needle may grow more scarce like this. You can see the same image of EUS imaging of a non distended uh, model. The needle couldn't penetrate the globe, just squash, just scratched, no penetration. In contrast, in case of a distended model, including the water sufficiently, a lot of water like a bowl, surface of globe had a very tension, very tension. So US imaging shows the needle could easily penetrate the globe and advance into a deeper portion of the globe, like a bowl. So another important factor is uh, puncture axis, direction of the jejunum. Longitudinal imaging is uh, much better, much better and easier to puncture. However, it is not always, it is not always easy to get long axis like this. Often, often, sometimes we have to puncture at short axis at that time, uh, keeping the jejunum distended. 
Jejun descent like a ball is very important for safe procedure, safe puncture, safe deployment. So that's why I created a dedicated double balloon tube, which can inject only between two balloons, but between two balloons to distend the targeted jejun, which is closer, closer from the stomach. So I'd like to show the animation of the inverse. So firstly, endoscope is over tube is advanced to the stricture. And using a guide wire and the catheter. Guide wire is advanced to the jejunum beyond the ligament of trites as far as possible. And then, uh, once uh, the standard EGD is, is removed, leaving the guide wire and the over tube in place. And the, over the guide wire, double, oh, sorry, double balloon tube is insertion. Over the, beyond the ligament of the and the double balloon as uh, simultaneously inflated. Maybe uh, uh, between the two balloons, uh, the distance of the length of the uh, two balloons is uh, 20 cm. And the inflation. And the over tube is removed, leaving the inflated double balloon in place. And the ES, ES scope is advanced in the stomach and at this moment, we inject, we inject the uh, uh, serine with uh, uh, indigo carmine. You can see very nicely distended, distended jejunum, and to detect easily by US imaging. And then finally, the heart anxious is advanced in the distended jejunum. If necessary, we put, we inject more and more additional therapy. And like uh, Moen uh, showed, same way. The pass is completed. Actually, so next I'd like to show the uh, actual EPAS e procedure. Uh, this is a long axis puncture uh, uh, version. Same as uh, the, this is a, a duodenal cancer, advanced duodenal cancer, and the guide wire advanced as long as possible beyond the thorax ligaments. And the standard EGD is removed, leaving the over tube and the guide wire in place. And the over the guide wire, uh, double balloon tube is advanced beyond the ligament of thorax and the two balloon set. First balloon you can see it here and the second balloon here. And it usually the, the balloon injection size uh, bladder shape and the most of it is uh, 40 to 50 cc both, both balloon. And so not yet inject not yet inject the serine between two balloons and once over tube removed, leaving the uh, double balloon tube in place. And the US scope insertion. And at this moment, we inject the uh, serine with compress. And the, you know, the uh, distended jejunum is a very correct target to puncture for e pass. Otherwise, uh, other, uh, other uh, jejunum or small intestine or colon is shrinking, so we cannot see uh, except uh, uh, distended jejunum. And if you, you can see very di nicely distended jejunum with, uh, like this. Very distended jejunum and longitudinal imaging. Long axis imaging is much better, much safer. 
and uh, already is a moment it shows uh, two cases. Uh, very easy, like uh, global drainage or uh, should assist drainage or uh, warm drainage. It's complete. So next, uh, I'd like to show the uh, next movie. Uh, this is the outlook of the actual EPAS procedure during the end of 2017 at the AIG in Hyderabad, you know, with uh, Don Juan Sale and uh, my junior. So, uh, I did I did the e pass by myself almost all uh, my by myself. First is uh, now already the standard EGD he was removed leaving the guideway in place and uh, by myself uh, we advanced the double tube over the guide wire and set a uh, collect portion and inflate the two balloons simultaneously. At this moment, uh, two, uh, basically two people is necessary. And after uh, inflated balloon, the equendoscope is ad advanced in the stomach. Then they inject, inject the serine with contrast to distend it jejunum sufficiently. And the hot action set. And after detection of the distended jejunum, I, I also, I, I said again, it is a very correct target. Like this, longitudinal. Maybe uh, everyone can do if like this uh, distended jejunum and they deploy the distal crunch in the jejunum. And usually, we recently we use a technique of the uh, inter channel scope channel deployment technique and finish. I remember very, very nicely. Oh, Sandeep here. I mean, okay. And, and the, so I, I'd like to show the next movie, uh, short axis puncture. Sometimes, uh, so no choice of a short axis puncture. At this moment, uh, this is a very useful technique by EPAS. Same as previous two cases. My cases, the EGD advance in front of the structure, and the guide wire advance as far as possible, and the over the guide wire double barrel advanced beyond the ligament of trites or correct position. First, yeah, here and here between two balloon two and twenty cm. And then, so injection to distend the jejunum. At this moment, look, looks uh, uh, half and half, short and uh, long axis. But uh, so 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30, uh, 30 seconds, uh, looks nice, but uh, finally, uh, no choice, uh, this, this position. This is a short axis. You can understand the uh, fluoroscopic imaging right there, like this. So, so the scope. Firstly, so uh, ideally, ideally like this or uh, like this is much better the long axis. But uh, in this moment, uh, moving here and no choice. Uh, finally, we decided the this uh, direct uh, direction, and uh, at this moment, the this e pass can make it possible to place safely, safely the, uh, this kind of large stent. This is also 20, 20 cm 
and uh, interworking channel deployment technique. And finish. You can see it very nicely. Well, the, yeah. And uh, as uh, Mowen mentioned, I also, uh, I don't intentionally so dilate uh, this uh, using a balloon, the stent, af immediately after the deployment to avoid the risk of the breathing or something. Anyway, so can scan shows, can scan shows a very nicely opening, very nicely opening the uh, stent. And the gastrography, gastrography shows that gravitically also very nicely uh, the flows of the liquid from the go to the inner side, shortcut. Also, the one uh, autopsy shows a very nicely creation of the anastomosis, uh, like the uh, surgical gastrogenesis. One previous technical review showed that EPAS took the shortest procedure time. So at this moment, uh, 25 minutes, but now uh, it takes only uh, 50 minutes for the beginning. So today you can see uh, several presentation. Maybe uh, you will be able to see a uh, several presentation we use GJ. I believe, I believe EPAS is a uh, established a safe and reliable technique for us, taking short, shorter procedure time. Moreover, even in case of a long time procedure, long procedure uh, at that time, uh, even at that time, uh, it is safely performed uh, because double balloon can keep the jejunum distended uh, sufficiently by additional injection without the buscopan if necessary. So, uh, you know, all of us are not professional interventional endoscopists, right? Like uh, Michael Jordan. But maybe, maybe just non-expertise, non-expertise or even, even beginners. Therefore, therefore, I'd like to recommend if us also, the use of a double balloon is still still limited in each country in the world. So finally, uh, I'm sure this must be stressful time for you as you deal with the situation in your hospital and uh, with your patient. Uh, please, please stay safe and healthy and I'm looking forward to actually seeing you again when, when, the crisis is over. Thank you, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Takao, that was a wonderful. Oh. Oh, nice presentation, Takao, nice to see you again of Colombia. Uh, a question, in Latin America, we don't know have the double ball of Takao. What is your technical and, advice to carry out the procedure? And the other one is the one by Takao. Uh, so um, I want questions on the technical aspects right now. Uh, so uh, one question, Takao, is cautery settings. Uh, is it the usual cautery setting for ERCPs and other procedures or something different? Uh, great question. The uh, standard uh, ESD is uh, auto cut, uh, the end cut mode, but uh, this is uh, uh, auto cut mode, one, 100 uh, uh, watt. And the, so if we can use the ICC, uh, the grade is four and the 100 auto cut mode. Okay, okay. And how much fluid do you inject between the two balloons? What is the uh, amount uh, usually? Okay. Okay, so first, so many years ago, we used uh, 15, 15 cm uh, length balloon between the two balloons. At that time, uh, 100 cc. Now is uh, we can use uh, 20, 20 cm length balloon, double balloon. At that time, so 120 cc uh, to 150, 150 cc. Okay. And uh, 
Okay, the, what are the methods used for keeping the fluid in small bubbles? So balloon is there. Uh, and you usually use 20 millimeters taka or you also sometimes use 15 millimeters uh, balloon? Uh, uh, sorry, stent. Stent. Uh, so recently, more, almost all the 20, 20 cm. If possible, uh, I'd like to use uh, more, 20, 25 if possible, but I'm not sure that it makes makes sense. So, but oh. uh, yeah, big, bigger is much better, like uh, uh, surgical gastrointestinal. Okay. Uh, Will I please uh, uh, a yeah. question for Takao? Yeah? Huh? yeah. Yeah. The question again, Takao. In uh, Latin America, we do not have the double bulb of Takao. What uh, is the your technical advice to carry out the procedure? Hmm? If you don't have the double balloon or double ball of Takao, yeah. what is your technical advice to carry out the procedure? So at that time, so of course, and no choice, uh, the just the injection method to like uh, moving cashier. And if possible, the, the, I'd like to the catheter Cassita insertion instead of the double balloon and they uh, inject a lot of water uh, like a pump or something but I'm not sure uh, actually the easily the water or selling close to the inner side that's why I so, saw um, except the uh, expertise of uh, interventional US endoscopist uh, and this uh, procedure is uh, sometimes Dangerous, uh, please wait the double balloon. Uh, Thank you. When is it? When is it coming? <laughs> <laughs> when uh, is the impasse? Yeah, uh, but uh, now, now, except myself, uh, in some countries, guys are already Anthony or Brazil or other countries, the guys are already is uh, now going going to use. Okay, good, 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 good. good. So, can so, can you comment something uh, from? Uh, Anthony? Anthony, yeah. So um, with the double balloon, it's a very good device because uh, it's a very stable platform. Um, you, you just need to, uh, I think the most important part is to find, uh, spend enough time to find the suitable loop or small bow to uh, puncture. So with this device, you don't need to be hurrying to change the scope and worry about the uh, fluid uh, escaping, escaping small bowel. And I also agree on Takao's um, um, comment that um, because uh, you are comparing to duodenal stent, and for duodenal stent, it's a very easy procedure uh, most trainees can do. So um, you are trying to substitute a much more complicated or possibly more expensive procedure uh, to duodenal stent. So you need to make it uh, a lot more easy. So with Takao's uh, device, um, actually our my trainees are doing it, um, and I, I when I supervise them, I don't need to sweat as well because um, if I sweat if I supervise someone doing GJ uh, without the device, I I'll be sweating a lot. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> learn it helps uh, for beginners. Okay, uh, there is a question from Damien from Singapore. Uh, hi, Damien. Any role mm. for safety wire placement after heart axios? So mm. uh, is, is it uh, a good, uh, uh, especially in the beginning, to place a wire and check that you are in the place? Ah, it, it is a good thing. So uh, sometimes uh, in case of a corridocodinostomy, I use uh, this technique. The guide wire, yeah. so mount it, but uh, so no no use uh, guide wire uh, before a puncture. But after uh, the cautery, uh, uh, the insertion of the uh, jejunum uh, freehand, after that the guide wire impresses uh, is one of uh, option to avoid the unnecessary complication. But uh, basically, uh, after mature of these techniques, uh, I don't, I just think uh, I'll take a lot of time or uh, no, no good now. Like Manolo, 
How do you think? <laughs> yes. Pretty handy. Manolo, hi, Manolo. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the team. Hello. Um, uh, can you hear me? Uh, there's a lot of echo yes, and yeah. background noise here. So I remember uh, some DDWs ago that we were arguing uh, at a symposium that Anthony put together on gallbladder drainage. <laughs> we took the bar on uh, Takao. How come these days if we need a guideline to do ERCP and everybody says you cannot do ERCP through the papilla without a guide wire. And we can go transmural with no guide wire uh, with hot axis. So this was the debate. And I remember very distinctly that maybe five, four, four or five years ago that I was against the guide wire for hot axis. Now I've become... I, at that time, I was too conservative with the axis. I've grown used to the cold axios, which we, of course, we needed to have a guide wire with the cold axios. But uh, now I've changed and I've seen the, uh, the, the beauty and the evidence of what Takao is saying, that the, uh, the guide wire actually gets in the way uh, when you're trying to access a mobile target like the CBD or the small bowel. So, of course, it is, if you are not very familiar with the, um, the tactile feel that the catheter gives you, in other words, if you can sense, is there too much friction when my axios catheter is going through, uh, my, through the elevator of my echoendoscope? Is there something funny? Is my position stable? You need to practice and grow confident. Uh, and for that, you need the pancreatic collections that are a very solid and stable target. For that early cases, for your learning curve in, in LAMS, you may use a guide word. But once you're over that uh, stage in your experience, I think that the freehand uh, uh, access is easier. And of course, as Takao mentioned, you may have already the guide wire inside your catheter just for safety, but not before you, you puncture your catheter into your target, just inside the delivery catheter. As soon as you, you sense that you're entering your target, the small bower or the CBD, that's the moment to push very gently uh, the guide wire in if necessary. Okay. So I, I change. Uh, I change from a, a always use a guide wire mentality with axios to freehand always if you can if you are confident with the catheter because it's easier and if it's easier probably it's also safer. Okay, thanks, 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 Tarkao. There are a lot more questions for you, uh, but I think we are a little uh, running a little late. So maybe we will take the questions after the next lectures. Um, Professor Miranda is uh, with us uh, from Valladolid, uh, Spain. Later, he's going to show us a live case also. Uh, today, he's, uh, first he'll show us the technique of how he does EUS uh, G gastroenterostomy. So I'm, I'm very honored uh, to be here. So I thank uh, Dr. Vinay Deer the Asian US group, uh, Ideal, and, uh, and the Prime, uh, the, the, the Prince of Wales Hospital. So, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Yes, so I guess. yes, yes. So I'm gonna, uh, Dr. Deer asked me to show a lot of videos, but even if it's a lot of videos in this presentation, I want to give you uh, some uh, points. First, uh, I'm going to mention the freehand technique. What is what makes this technique unique uh, with, regarding other alternatives? A step-by-step -step description of the freehand te technique for gastroenteroanastomosis, how to deal with problems, and then my conclusions. So the uh, Gastroenterostomy was first performed in animal models 
using the old uh, axes that require uh, needle guide wear, dilation, stent delivery catheter insertion. So uh, the first case in humans were done by Dr. Itoi in Tokyo. It was pancreatic collection and gallbladder. And then he developed the gastroenterostomy technique. But these pioneers, Dr. B. Puller, in the animals, they had to use very special devices, very special catheter. That catheter that is longer uh, available is called the Navix. It used to have a side blade. There were also anchor guides uh, to prevent the rebound from the pushing aside that Dr. Itoi has nicely shown to us today with a glove uh, in, in, in the bus, the glove model. So this development of the hot axis was very spectacular. A lot of thinking, a lot of design and engineering, a lot of experiments are behind this idea. This uh, replaces all these anchor guide wires, the Navix catheter, everything, because this uh, cautery uh, tip at the right settings can like melt away tissues and very easily access one target from the next. This is, to my knowledge, the first reported case of the freehand technique. This is reported from Tokyo Medical University. This is Afrin Loop syndrome. And look how I'm going to play it again. You need to look how the tip of the catheter enters the small bowel, and then the fluid boils. The white bubbles, this is very important to see. And then you know for sure that your tip is inside the target, and then you can deploy backwards the first flange or distal flange towards the, your access site, which in, in this case is the stomach. This is the first reported use of the freehand technique with a hot axios. Then this is a European multi-center study on gallbladder drainage. And look at the procedural outcome in this study. Uh, operators of different levels of expertise the median stent deployment time was here 4.5 minutes. And bear in mind that this is always hot axios, but when people were using the hot axios over a guide wire, in other words, needle first, then guide wire, then hot axios, the median uh, stent deployment time was 7.7 .7 minutes. And when they were using the freehand technique, into the gallbladder, the median time is 3.5, 3.1 minutes. And you may wonder, so is that a big difference? 4.6 minutes between the freehand technique and the over the wire technique. Believe me, when you are targeting the small bowel, four minutes, 4.6 minutes is really an eternity. A lot of things can go wrong in four minutes when you have a needle in the jejunum when you're, that you're targeting from the stomach. So this is a very important point for the freehand technique. Or oh, the other thing, this is gallbladders, I remind you, uh, you can use without fluoroscopy. Uh, so people, operators and dosnographers were confident that with the freehand technique, they didn't need any fluoroscopy or limited fluoroscopy at all. And this is not possible with the standard uh, needle guide wire over the wire guide wire catheter insertion. So for the gallbladder, it has a lot of implications. You can go to the ICU and drain a gallbladder at the bedside without having to move a very sick patient. And it's also interesting for the gastroenterostomy procedure. So we have this free freehand access technique for gastroenteroanastomosis. Uh, what is what do we need to bear in mind? We need to be uh, to be to identify the target accurately. For that, we have the double balloon. Uh, this is one of the targeting devices that you can use uh, when you're using the freehand access technique. But you cannot go wrong if you're doing freehand access. Uh, you have to be sure that this is the small bowel. You uh, and and the double balloon is one of the ways you have to locate your target. Uh, this is our series coming out, uh, published in, in a much lesser journal, but the same year 
that uh, the Dr. Itoy's uh, series came out in GUT. Uh, this is patients coming from uh, San Francisco, Dr. B. Muller, uh, Dr. Barthe uh, from New York, and also from Valladolid, 26 patients. And you see that we had the so-called assisted methods, the contrast field balloon, was very commonly used, especially by the Americans in Cornell. We also use an ultra-slim upper endoscope, uh, parallel uh, to the US code, has the stricture nasobiliary drain technique, which is the one we're gonna discuss today for freehand uh, access location. So Dr. Kashab uh, mentioned already this, this technique. You pass a balloon, a balloon catheter, pass the stricture into the trites angle, distal to the stricture, you inflate with balloon, and then you can grab the wire or puncture the balloon. So, what is the step-by-step -step, uh, freehand technique uh, that we use with a nasobiliary, which is wrong name because we don't reroute the catheter through the nose, so it's an oro-jejunal catheter, and the catheter is not in the baldac, but it is the same nasobiliary uh, drainage catheter that we use for the balda. It's nothing special, so this is readily available. Uh, I know this is a very sophisticated audience. Uh, of course, you have to have the right indication. Uh, you have to have uh, expert uh, uh, sedation and fluoroscopy, everything. But this is a very important technique step that I didn't want to omit mentioning. So I want to mention that it's very useful to have um, nasogastric suction or aspiration at least overnight for 12 hours before the procedure because the risk is going to be much lesser. This is not a real patient, so I don't need to consent in the patient to use the picture. So what do we need for equipment? Of course, linear US therapeutic channel. Maybe you want to also have a forward or side viewing therapeutic channel endoscope. These days, we are using the echo endoscope uh, for a guide wire placement. We don't need another endoscope. And then, of course, we, we need cautery cauter settings. Devices we use uh, for uh, a standard 0 0.035 inch guide wire. And we like very much this three layer uh, catheter to advance distally the guide wire into the jejunum, the Oasis 8.5 French catheter. It is only 8.5 in the pushing segment of the catheter, but the tip is very floppy, is five French. Then we prefer 8.5 French nasobiliary drain, drainage tube, as opposed to smaller diameters, seven French, because the flow that we get is, is much higher. Then we have a water pump, a standard endoscopy water pump for, to provide nice distension of the small bowel, we also like to mix some methylene blue and contrast in, in syringes. And then of course, you, we need a cautery tip lens that I will emphasize, uh, you need to deploy step by step. There are other cautery tip lens, other than Axios these days available, but I would say that the step by step deployment of the flanges is also very important. So we have everything ready before we start. And then this is, these are the three step guideway passage, scope exchange, uh, uh, target distension, uh, catheter access, and then stem deployment. And I'm gonna show you this in a video in, in, in one sequence that my colleague Ramon Sanchez Ocaña nicely edited for us. This is a case we did last Tuesday. This is the Oasis catheter, look. It is very uh, flexible and we can make the catheter loop. This is the uh, tri-tangle, both second, third tri and the catheter, I'm gonna show it again because I wasn't pointed to you. So to make the catheter go forward, instead of looping, we bend the catheter, we push at the same time, guide wire and catheter, and we go distally. This is very easy to pass distally into the jejunum, as Dr. Itoi told us. Then, this is uh, the 8.5 catheter that over the wire, we can push past the triangle, and we are using the echo endoscope. As we remove, 
you see this is the echo endoscope we don't need to exchange and we go side by side with the same echo endoscope we apply a little bit of traction on the nasability drain even we can reposition this loop in the stomach we can pull backwards and now we put some contrast with methylene blue we have the echo endoscope in the posterior wall of the stomach we get the alignment but before i show you the alignment this is three centimeters so we can go freehand we see the water boil we deploy distal flange we pull backwards and these days we do intra-channel stent deployment and then when we see the methylene blue coming we know we are right we didn't enter the peritoneum we can also confirm by endoscopic vision as i said this is very fast and this is this can be done provided we get the distinction so the critical issues with this technique is one uh, you need to have a nasobility drain in place guide wave passage uh, in this case the oro the nasogastric sanction was not done uh, stricture passage was very easy because we had a, a rodino stem that was not functioning so uh, instead of the oasis catheter we could use uh, sphincter tom uh, because we were already there and then in this case this is an old case that's uh, already shown we have we use a seven french nasobiliary drain we are past the trites into the fourth duodenum we inject contrast and methylene blue and the second critical step we have nicely distended small bowel it's pushing away the small bowel uh, like dr itoy was showing to us in his uh, glove model so we have good alignment here uh, we have uh, the nasobility drain we were not using a pump in those uh, days we were using injection with a syringe and you see we think we have more or less good alignment but this is not over distended we are going through the stomach and not entering the small bowel. These we need to see with the ultrasound. We are creating tenting, pushing away the small bowel, and it is very important that we prevent that caveat, and we actually see the water boil, uh, so we, we, before we deploy the distal flange. Otherwise, we're gonna end up in the peritoneum. Again, confirmation. So this is the last uh, part of our technique. You see here, we are, we are not looking for the black marker. We are deploying uh, inside the channel. And then the fifth step of stand delivery is that we down the elevator, we make the elevator down, we push with the catheter, and we push away the proximal flange from the uh, channel. What problems can we have? First problem, the guy word does not go um, does not go beyond the stricture. That happens very uncommonly, but it is typical of third duodenal stricture. Strictures that are in the third portion of the duodenum sometimes it's really difficult. So what do we do? We do the graded injection technique to provide uh, adequate distinction of our target. So you see a collapse uh, jejunal loop here. We can uh, see the contour, the outline. So first we use a 22 gauge uh, needle with saline. Of course, we can feel we are inside, but we cannot really feel whether we are inside the lumen or one of the lawyer layers. This is one bleb intramural injection. We're only injecting saline here, saline solution. Once we have an adequately distended, we create another puncture with a 19 gauge needle and we, we put contrast and methylene blue. But first we need to distend with a 22 gauge needle. Now this is ready for freehand technique axios with, um, with, with a hot axios catheter. So we, we remove the needle and quickly, uh, without giving any time for this fluid to go away, we push. And then we can do 
burn through the stomach and the jejunal wall. So what to do if you, if you don't see, if you didn't see the fluid in the jejunum boil, if you don't see the white bubbles, do you deploy the stem or you don't? My recommendation is if you are not, if you didn't see the bubbles boil, you have to be very careful. And if you don't see the catheter inside the small bowel, don't deploy, go back and make another pass because a puncture through the gastric wall is not dangerous, is not risky, but deploying into the peritoneum is. So in this case, we didn't follow that tip, that advice. We deployed even, deployed even if we didn't see the catheter boy, uh, we ended up with misplacement. So this is not opening, this is in no man's land in the peritoneum. Of course, when we open, we don't see any methylene blue coming back. This is a sure sign that we're not in. This is peritoneum, for those of you who are not familiar with it. So what do we do when this mistake happens or this problem happens? This is called uh, misplacement or misdeployment. It can be distally into the target. That never happens with uh, gastroenterostomy. That may happen in the gallbladder. Uh, that also very rare, complete misdeployment uh, or misplacement. However, this partial type of misdeployment is very common with a small bowel. All of you have seen it happening, especially the odds ratio is 10 times higher if the case is done at a live demonstration, like the one we're going to do later in, in later today in our unit. I hope we don't have that risk. However, it may happen and you need to know what to do. My recommendation is don't panic. Uh, don't rush uh, calling the sergeant on duty. Try it, see if you can fix it. So if there is no uh, solid content in the stomach, you are safe. Nothing wrong happen. You, you first dilate the axis, leave a guide through into the peritoneum, and then very carefully, you remove over the wire, the misdeployed axis. That's what I call the wise salvage technique. Balloon dilate your axis, leave a wire, and then remove the axis over the wire with fluoro control. And this is provided two things. Your stomach does not have solid uh, contents because you did the nasogastric suction step before the procedure. And the, the other condition, very important, is that you have CO2 insufflation and very good control of the uh, peritoneal uh, pressure. And you don't need any special devices. It's just palpation of the belly, but one smart fellow or one smart nurse. And then the second thing you do is you follow the wire. You have the over uh, the scope clipping device, and then you identify the perforation. You may do suction or you may use uh, a T forceps. You put both edges of the perforation into the cap and then deploy the obesco. Then, then you are safe. You can put a duodenal stent and the patient will do well. The other not so wise salvage technique that you may employ and that it's very relatively easy to do if you have a double channel endoscope is note salvage of the gastroenterostomy. This is balloon dilation of a 15 millimeter axis. You have this uh, jejunal loop filled with contrast right across your axis. And you can check with fluoroscopy. You can do needle knife of the serosa and you can see the methylene blue on the contrast. And then, because this is only one channel scope, there is some pushing away of the small bowel, but you have a long length of wire. You can advance a second axis inside over the wire, inside the small bowel, deploy the distal flange of the second axis and pull backwards with uh, a gastroscope, a therapeutic channel gastroscope towards the first axis that is lying in the stomach, and then do the lambs in lambs technique to salvage the gastroenterostomy. So this is not the wise salvage, but it is a little bit wild, but it's also 
very uh, safe if you have CO2 insufflation and you have um, good uh, flora control. So um, my summary and conclusions, I, I would agree that uh, with Dr. Itoi that the double balloon is a very good way to distend, uh, uh, target and, and locate your jejunum for gastroenterostomy. But with an 8.5 French uh, nasal biliary drainage catheter past the trites ligament, and uh, pump insufflation, uh, pump distension of fluid and then contrast and saline, nearly the same quality of uh, targeting and distension can be achieved with a device that is readily available at most units. And, um, and it's also, I would say, uh, the, the step number one, the advancement of the catheter uh, past the duodenal stricture into the target is, I would say, it's easier, it does not require any learning curve as compared to the double balloon tube. And I think that's all because now if technology help us, uh, we will be able to show one of these cases live so we can discuss over the procedure nuances um, on the go later on. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Manolo. Thank you very much uh, for a fantastic uh, lecture. You really covered not only the good parts, but the bad parts <laughs> of the technique also very, very well. And we have accumulated close to 70 questions now. Uh, very, very interested audience. Uh, they want to know uh, lots of things. So um, a, a very common question, Takao, is why is the e tube not available everywhere? Lots of people are asking. <laughs> so is there a possibility of it being commercialized and being available uh, easily to everyone or it is still uh, in the process? Takao? I think uh, so listen to regulation is uh, very getting strict and strict, very strict. So that's why it depends on the each country but uh, recently, the most country is very high level of the regulation. That's why, so non-approval, non-approval devices can, cannot be easily used. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but, uh, um, sorry yes, to interrupt. Man, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. We, we go were ahead. conducting, we are conducting a trial in Spain, a prospective randomized trials by Dr. Gornals in Barcelona. We are comparing um, uh, axios with double pigtails for uh, and necrosis, uh, or a world of necrosis. And we learned from the regulatory agency in Spain that the pigtails, catheter, are not approved for world of necrosis. So can you imagine? This is the <laughs> craziness of the regulatory issues. We were trying a new device, the hot axios, which is already approved by the European uh, uh, FDA, but the pictures, nobody sought to look for approval. So this is crazy. And uh, I've seen reports, Takao, of homemade uh, double balloon, uh, one uh, in Canada, in Montreal. They're, they are using interventional radiology balloons to create a homemade double balloon catheter for gastroenterostomy, but this is, uh, this is a, a real shame, but it's a real issue. Uh, and, and of course, with the nation. Manolo, the next thing. question is to you. Uh, 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 Thomas uh, Verghis uh, from Kerala, he's a surgeon, I know him very well. So, a surgical uh, question How will you make sure that there are no blocks beyond in the bowel selected? So, that is one question. Other question is Can the procedure be repeated? if the stent gets blocked. Oh, uh, how, how do you make sure there are no small bowel, uh, like in peritoneal carcinomatosis? Right, right, right. You, yeah. you not have only one point, 
I would say for our population, which is the same population that would undergo renal stenting, fortunately, that's a very small percent of patients. It's a, it's a minority. It's a very uncommon problem. But of course, in the right clinical uh, scenario, you may suspect maybe pre-interventional imaging may help you. Uh, w whether there is dilation that you can assess with CT or uh, EMR uh, enterography. Uh, of course, during the procedure, you try to get an enterogram sometimes when that is suspected. And if you see a small bowel nicely, uh, you assume there is no distal blockage. And of course, if there is distal blockage, you can also treat with another axiom through the first one. And that there are reports coming from, um, from the United States and from Spain by Dr. Subtil in Pamplona that you can treat a, a distal jejunal obstruction by metastatic implants, by US guided enteroanastomosis from the small bowel to the colon on from small bowel to other part of small bowel. So this is not as opposed to surgical gastroenterostomy a distal block is not a major issue because you can retreat the patient. How easy it is to intervene on a patient with a stem blockage? We have seen a gastroenterostomy stem blockage very, very rarely, as opposed to renal, to renal stems, which are nine or 12 centimeter long. The axios is only one centimeter long, plus the planche. So it is very uncommon to obtain blockage, to, to, get, to end up with blockage. That has only happened to us in patients where we use for benign and they live many, many, many months, years, like in chronic pancreatitis with portal hypertension. And we can treat very easily just by removing the debris and placing maybe another stent inside if that is relapsing problem. So I hope I've answered the questions, Dinay. Okay, now uh, the question, another question for you, uh, Manolo. Do you need to remove the stent ever? Uh, the, uh, all experience from Dr. Barthe in France and others, our, uh, our own unpublished experience is that if you remove, the fistula shuts down. So if at least for gastroenteral anastomosis. And that's, uh, that's a problem when you want to use this for uh, permanent in benign disease because you always need a stent. This is not, surgeons are right when they say this is not a real anastomosis. This is a 10th range hole that we are expanding with a stent into 20 millimeters. So it is not a real large anastomosis. But on the other hand, that feature that the uh, gastroenteric anastomosis shuts down if you pull out the stent is a good thing when you want to use it for access in room Y gastric bypass because you are sure that the fistula is going to shut down. So if you pull out the stent and you are through the stomach, the fistula is going to shut down. So you always need to have something in place. Maybe hi Moen, I see you now uh, pop up in the screen. So maybe new strategies will pop up uh, and are evolving with these. If, if we use magnets, for instance, around an axial stent, maybe you can really have large area of tissue necrosis and you could end up with permanent anastomosis. But so far, if you pull out the stent, the anastomosis shuts down. I don't know if any of the panel have other experience because this is very, very experienced and are using this for a number of indications, benign and malignant. Okay, so uh, 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 I have uh, one question which I want all of you to answer. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, usage of uh, EUS guided gastroenterostomy in benign conditions. Brief answers from all four of you, please. Starting Moin with was the uh, first Manolo. One to publish on that. Moin was the first one in the world to publish on that. He probably has the longest and largest experience. Yeah, so um, so it's a tricky uh, tricky indication, and it's definitely last resort. You know, patients um, uh, good scenarios for this. Uh, I've had few patients with um, 
duodenal hematomas. Uh, you know, this is a rare entity, but it can happen. I've had two of them. And we know these duodenal hematomas cause complete gastric outlet obstruction, but they resolve, resolve on, on their own. You can put a duodenal stent, it's not removable. There's really not a good option for this. This is a great patient for a benign EUSGJ. And after that benign uh, entity is resolved, then you just pull the GJ, it closes, and then you're done. So this is an easy scenario. Uh, other patients are those with the duodenal uh, uh, obstruction from chronic pancreatitis. Uh, you know, uh, so a lot of these patients have portal venous thrombosis, a lot of varices. Uh, so surgical gastrogenostomy sometimes is not a great idea. Uh, the issue with uh, putting, uh, doing a gastrogenostomy is if you leave that stent for a long time, and I always think of benign obstruction as a lower grade obstruction than, than, um, than a malignant obstruction. What keeps this stent open in malignant obstruction is, uh, is a flow. As long as you have flow through the stent, it, the stents don't get oh, uh, tumor or, or benign tissue overgrowth. What we see with benign obstructions is because food and liquid go both ways, the stent is not functioning at a level uh, uh, in, as in patients with uh, malignant obstruction. So we see a lot of benign tissue overgrowth. I've had, I've had patients if the stent is there for like two years, you go in, you can't actually see the stent. Uh, it's all benign tissue overgrowth. So if I'm doing a, uh, a GJ for a benign indication, I like to do an endoscopy every six to 12 months to keep an eye on the stent, to make sure it's not getting embedded, to make sure we don't have significant tissue overgrowth that's gonna impede further treatment. Any other points, Anthony? No, we're not doing um, GJ for B9. Echo? I have uh, one longest cases. And seven and a half years back, I press a uh, hot action, uh, no, 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 cold it, uh, yeah, cold action. And then the, after three years, after three years, the membrane broken and the uh, ingross happened. And uh -huh. now uh, two thirds uh, the, the lumen, the occlusion, but still, still keep, still keep open then the- Oh, nice. EGD, EGD is uh, easily going, going back. Yeah, it is a very, very nice case. Okay, okay. Manolo, have you placed for benign indications? Yes, uh, not very common. Again, malignant is a primary indication. And uh, leaving aside uh, access for ERCP in long limb patients, such as Fu and Y, for outlet obstruction, uh, I agree with Moeen, uh, a similar indication to duodenal hematoma is necrotizing pancreatitis uh, in patients with uh, transient duodenal stenosis because of edema, necrosis, and uh, this is, uh, people are not very much aware of this indication because these patients are usually managed with enteral feeding, a PEG jet or jejunostomy, but really if the patient is stable, necrosis takes a few weeks to heal, the duodenal suture is going to be in place for, for two months or a few weeks. So we are doing gastroenterostomy temporarily in patients with that type of suture. And this is very good because everybody's happy. The patient can eat, the patient can go home, is not wearing any external drains. For chronic pancreatitis is the, uh, with a severe portal hypertension, non-surgical uh, candidates, and portal biliopathy, in the end, there are, over the very long term, there are problems with angulation, dysfunction, and it is not so great an indication. But for temporary gastroenterostomy, for gallbladder obstruction, I think it's a great indication, even if the patients are very few. Okay. Uh, so, okay, let's move on. We are short of time. There are lots of questions. A lot of people want to ask a lot of questions from all of you. Uh, so let's hope we can uh, answer all those questions. So next, I am going to uh, present the Indian data. We uh, have started doing uh, GJ late in India because the Axios was not available. So a short, small amount of data, only one year. Uh, so um, 
how do I do it? Share screen. Can you see my screen? Okay. So, uh, as I told you, um, and Takao and others have mentioned, uh, we keep getting patients of malignant gastric outlet obstruction and they are in agony because uh, there is a physical problem, psychological, emotional problems. Uh, we currently have uh, had, till a few years back, options of an enteral stent and a surgical GJ. Surgical GJ is uh, a great procedure going on for 70 years and a good option in those who are expected to live for very, very long, uh, five, six, seven, eight, or maybe 20 years. Uh, enteral stent was a good procedure for those in whom you expected to, them to live about three, four months and five months and not beyond that. If they lived beyond that, which is happening very often now because of the chemotherapy and other agents available for cancer management, uh, we would see that uh, the patient would come back with problems. Um, in the last few years, we have this advent of EUS guided gastroenterostomy, thanks to all these stalwarts who are uh, sitting in front of us. Um, of course, Binmolar, uh, Kenneth Binmolar introduced it first. It's about eight years now. Uh, you saw that the procedure is uh, evolving. We have three grades, four grades sitting here, and I think there are three different techniques that are being used differently in Asia, differently in Europe, differently in US. So um, we are still looking for a technique which uh, can be propagated everywhere. We need comparative studies. So we are still in early days. Now, pre-hand technique like how um, Manolo did or how Muin did is a fantastic uh, technique if it can be done easily. But how, what I feel is that this technique is really for big, big experts. So if you are a beginner, you will feel very scared to puncture through a stomach. We are, uh, barring Anthony, we are all gastroenterologists and we get scared of puncturing through the bowel. So um, that was, is an issue. And so, especially in India, a lot of people keep asking about e past you. And that also, unfortunately, is not available outside of select centers. So currently um, in India, we have a situation where Axios arrived pretty late, almost I think one and a half years now. It is expensive, especially if you compare it to the cost of an enteral stent. Uh, technical expert expertise, uh, we have great experts in India, uh, but the issues that I just now discussed, uh, the issue of anchoring the Deodinum or a jejunum, it doesn't appear very easy to the beginners, those who begin uh, doing these procedures. It's, it's, there is a worry about it. And there is, of course, a fear of perforation because then the case goes to a surgeon and um, everybody, not Manolo, who wear axios, uh, he, you can go through the axios and do things uh, like what he did, the wonderful procedure. And also, uh, surgical GJ and enteral stenting are well established, very, very well established. Enteral stenting uh, is commonly done by most interventional endoscopists. So, USGE, for it to establish, uh, needs to show that it is really superior to the other uh, procedures, uh, especially uh, in malignant gastric outlet obstruction. So, we started getting these stents last year and we started the procedure in March 2019. We were fortunate to receive an e-pass tube from Professor Itoi as part of a clinical project. Um, we started studying them prospectively. Uh, patients with unresectable malignant gastric outlet obstruction with performance status 2 or below uh, were included. All patients who come to me are offered both enteral strength or EUSGE and we give them advantages and disadvantages of both. And um, I ask them to make a choice. And what has happened is we get a 50-50, which is very interesting. Um, about half of them end up choosing uh, enteral strength. And I think that is probably because of the costing. Uh, enteral strength placement is uh, cheaper compared to an axios placement. But the other half did, do choose uh, 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 Axios uh, placement. 
So uh, the method has already been very, very well uh, described by uh, Takao, Moin, uh, and Manolo. Uh, we uh, do gastric lavage, uh, e pass tube placement. Uh, Takao already showed beautifully. Then balloon distension, fill uh, between the two balloons. Uh, we have uh, exclusively so far used only a 20 mm uh, balloon. We haven't used a 15 mm uh, so far. Uh, we are a little more careful in all our patients because we are beginning. So we do a check scopy after 24 hours. We put in contrast and see that everything is fine and then only allow the patient to um, take the uh, uh, solids. Uh, and then we do follow-up scopy at two and four months. We call them back. Um, so um, over the past one year, we have had 18 uh, patients in whom USDA was done. Four were done by our friends uh, who came to me for the conferences, uh, Manolo and uh, Anthony. Uh, and at the same time, we had 16 entrance strengths. So it's a very small experience, one year experience. Uh, but we have learned a lot in these 18 procedures. Uh, uh, we had, uh, as far as technical success is concerned, both were very, very good. Uh, as far as ZJ goes, we had uh, one perforation. Uh, I will show you later uh, about this perforation. This patient, uh, um, we could not find uh, the opening because there was a lot of bleeding. I think there was a splenic artery uh, tear. Uh, the stent went into the peritoneum and was very close to the splenic artery. So there was a lot of bleeding. So the patient went for emergency surgery and recovered. Uh, went home, was eating well. And with enteral stent, we had a funny problem. Uh, we are doing a trial uh, with Anthony on different two different types of enteral stent. So one uh, covered stent is still flat and inverted upon itself. So it was uh, there was no way anything would go through that. So we had to remove it and replace. But by and large, technically, I mean both procedures were very very nice, no problem. Uh, the technical problems that we had with uh, EUSGJ was uh, already mentioned. Uh, distal flange did not open fully in two patients. I have discussed this with the cow also in person. Um, so um, probably uh, we started deploying too early. There was little space. We don't know. Uh, in one of the uh, cases, what we did was We pulled out the stent and then successfully. In the other patient, um, I already told you, he perforated. So there was, you know, so these were the two patients, 20 mm uh, stents. I show you this one patient where we had the problem. Uh, so see here. So this is a, a nicely, um, in, we have a saline here. There's a nice loop of jejunum, nice position. But see here, now looking back, after talking to Takao, I think we deployed it probably too close. Should have started deploying it a little distally, more, more close to this uh, general wall. So uh, as we start deploying, we notice that the stent is not opening. We saw it uh, both in uh, on the EOS as well as on the X-ray. Um, so as you see, the stent is just not opening. And we have uh, pushed it and then we're drawing the thing assembly. So we withdrew the whole thing. You see there is some small amount of fluid collection here. This time we punctured a little deep. Uh, same, same time, immediately. And uh, um, luckily this time it worked. Uh, we could see the stent uh, opening, although it did open slowly. So whether this was a problem of less space or a 20 millimeter or both, uh, ultimately this uh, small collection, you can see the fluid here was uh, there. Uh, and then we could deploy uh, this stent well. Um, and uh, you can see here the stent is opening. Not ideal, but it is still opening. I would have liked it to open a bit more. Uh, and um, and then we deployed it in the scope as everybody else has shown. So I am showing these problems for the beginners that these are the problems that even the experts will face, we learn. And uh, so this time it was okay. You can see that uh, 
the stent is nicely in place. Methylene blue was a very, very uh, welcome sign. So what we learned from this was push it deep. Very, very important. Push it as deep as possible. And if it is not opening freely, please take a breath before you deploy the stent. Otherwise, there will be a problem. So this uh, patient uh, did well. Uh, he uh, started eating well next day and we discharged him. He's okay still now. Um, patient did not have any significant pain. So this was the cholerae which we did of him. If you see on this cholerae, see this, this is an extraposition of contrast. This is the jejunum. You see here, there is a mild extraposition of contrast here. But the patient um, was asymptomatic, did not have any major problem. Uh, what about functional results? Uh, um, so, excellent functional results with GJ. Uh, all patients when we discharge were taking solids. With enteral stent, the results were not so great, even at the time of discharge. Uh, almost 25% of them were not taking solids, uh, and this could be because of various reasons. It may not have anything to do with the stent. It could be that uh, there is some aperistalsis in the stomach and uh, the tumor condition and other things. So, um, enteral stent results at the beginning, at discharge, also were not so good. At one month, uh, I told you with GJ we had that perforation. That patient died after a month, although he was eating well. So um, this patient, one death in USGJ, in enteral stent, there was one patient who died at three weeks. Again, the patient was eating when he died. And one stent, uh, interestingly enough, got blocked in two weeks. It happens sometimes. So this was this patient, the stent got blocked. And you see here, the stent is not seen. There is no stent here. It is completely covered by tumor. So this, this was an uncovered stent. Uh, we did a, a conray and you see here, this is a narrowing still there. So there is an ingrowth on both sides. Uh, and we thought we'll balloon dilate it. And uh, because the patient had already spent a lot of money, so we balloon dilated. During dilation, it all looked very nice. That okay, patient. But the moment the balloon would be uh, removed, patient was not able to eat anything. We sent him home with a rice tube uh, for one week, thinking that maybe the dilation will happen gradually, but nothing happened. So this was the situation again after one week. Um, pretty bad situation. Patient was not taking at all. So we offered him GJ. Uh, uh, he agreed for the GJ, and then we. A GJ. After that, the next day patient was eating well. So this was a crossover from uh, enteral stent to GJ uh, within one month. Uh, at four months, um, GJ, fantastic results. Patients are very happy. Everybody is eating, there are no problems. And now, 42% of patients are not eating solid. They are not happy with, they are eating. It is not that they are not eating, but they are not happy with what they are eating. So uh, these are early uh, things. We, we, our median uh, follow-up period is only about seven months. Uh, but already I uh, am getting convinced that um, we should probably offer GJ more uh, to patients than enteral strengths because the functional results are extremely good in these uh, patients. See, this is a follow-up endoscopy we did at four months. You can see this is a black stent, completely turned black, but nicely seen jejunum. Absolutely no problems. Patient is happy, patient is eating well. Uh, no problems at all. So uh, my conclusions uh, are, uh, what we found is it's a small data, but uh, EULG uh, provides an efficient medium-term palliation and if we are looking for an option in uh, malignant obstructive jaundice where you need to palliate for about a year in most of the patients, uh, it looks like a very, very good option compared to a surgical GJ also because the patient doesn't want to go for surgery with an advanced cancer uh, and uh, probably surgical GJ is good for benign indications. But for malignant uh, indications, enteral stents, uh, patients are not happy for the money they spend quite a few of them and that is the issue while um, with enteral strength most of the patients are pretty happy i think what our data does is 
basically confirm what Manolo and Moin has already published uh, with their com large comparative trials that it is it is a um, better options compared to enteral stent. We will listen to Anthony, of course, uh, as to what he has to say about comparison of various techniques. So I end my um, presentation here. Um, okay. We will take uh, questions. Uh, okay, lots of questions, lots of questions. Can we use a covered biliary stent instead of second axios in misplacement situation as it is expensive to use two axios? This is from India. Manolo? Um, not a biliary or just wall stent. Uh, I, I've, I've heard... Covered, no. covered biliary. No, no, definitely not biliary. It's too small, too short. But I know of cases, I don't know if Moins or Michel Cajale, where they've salvaged uh, this misplacement by using a long enteral or esophageal stent. So, but, but a biliary stent, I think, is too, narrow, too thin and too short. So another way to do the stent in stent will be using a larger, uh, high, lo high caliber enteral through the scope or esophageal stent. Moin has maybe has some experience in that. Yeah, the uh, the Niti S Taiwong through the scope is a GL stent, um, so that's probably your your best option. And the shaft diameter of that, uh, I think it's 18 millimeter. Uh, yes. So if you're using a 15 millimeter axis stent, that will completely uh, seal seal it around. Um, so that's probably your go-to uh, salvage stent. Uh, in, in specific instances. Okay. What should we do if uh, inadvertently we puncture the opposite wall of the jejunum? Taka? Sorry, sorry again. What should we do if we puncture the opposite wall? Opposite wall of the jejunum. Uh -huh. No, you punctured too much. <laughs> I, I have no experience, but uh, so uh, <laughs> you first you are first uh, non deployment and uh, non what's the uh, the opening case. I guess uh, you should push more. Push uh, more, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I took advice from you after I had. This yeah, problem. I think yes, so. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, what should I, be the? Yeah. Yeah. Manolo. I, I'd say if if you have a well distended uh, small bowel, it's really difficult to burn the opposite wall. So the issue is actually the opposite. You cannot even burn through the first wall. So let alone uh, burn <laughs> to the opposite. Uh, but if you are so ardent that you burn, you know, stomach, first duodenal wall or jejunal wall, and then second wall, I guess that if you properly place the axios, balloon dilate, and go in with a scope and clip, it would be okay. But that also, I have a lot of trouble, like I've shown in the videos, but I've never had that trouble of uh, burning into the opposite wall. Is so there a minimum? Uh, sorry, yeah. Theoretical concern that you have ju that in your, uh, in your nightmares, but not in your real life. So what should be the minimum distance between the stomach and jejunum before puncture? Anthony, is there a, uh, like we have for uh, world of necrosis, is there a distance that you would say for puncturing? Yeah, so um, the axial stand is around one centimeter in, in length. So in theory, um, if anything is more than one centimeter, then we try not to puncture that. Although so you can occasionally try to stretch it by, by a few millimeters, but um, yeah, in general, one centimeter. Uh, what is the benefit of EOS GJ over laparoscopic GJ? Are you covering it, Anthony, in your uh, talk? Then you answer. Uh, yeah, 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 I'll be talking about that. Okay, okay, let's leave it there. Uh, okay, we discussed benign. You, you know, benign, benign. Yeah, yeah. So, 
I, we know that in some cases, a laparoscopic G, a gastrogenostomy doesn't work well sometimes. You know, the, the, in case of a, a surgical gastrogenostomy, sometimes the, uh, the anastomosis bend. So bend, and they, that, that causes the uh, dysfunction of the uh, flow of the food or uh, liquid. That's why, so theoretically, the uh, always open by hot axis. That's why the much better, I guess, uh, theoretically, also much better than gas, uh, gas, the laparoscopic GJ. And, and also there is a risk of gastroparesis. Uh, probably Anthony is going to talk about it. Uh, there's an incidence of gastroparesis after uh, any kind of gastric surgery, including uh, GJ. One question to Takao. Any uh, danger of the balloon catheter, the e pass catheter, getting stuck between the stent flange and digital wall? <laughs> nice question. So, so your e pass catheter getting stuck no. between the stent Maybe. and the digital wall? Of course, uh, after uh, after the uh, fully deflation of the balloon and remove, just yeah, no no problem. No, we never had such problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but theoretically, it appears that it may get stuck. Exactly. Yeah. So, is the over tube to be taken along with gastroscopy? Uh, yes, yes. That answer is yes. So, it is a, the first part is gastroscopy with over tube and then uh, you pass the e pass tube through the over tube okay i think we'll take some more questions afterwards uh, anthony you are on uh, anthony is going to distill for us what is the current status and what should be the future uh, as far as uh, the various techniques are uh, concerned anthony Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, do you have my uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna be uh, talking about um, USGJ versus stenting versus uh, surgical GJ. So once again, um, thank you very much for uh, letting me speak. Uh, very happy that so many of you are interested in um, this new technique. These are my disclosures. So um, tonight we've been uh, concentrating mostly on uh, U.S. gutter gastro uh, jejunostomy, uh, but this is uh, just one part of a whole family of U.S. gutter gastro enterostomy procedures, like uh, U.S. gutter transgastric ELCP edge procedure, as well as the U.S. gutter drainage or afferent limb obstruction. Uh, but of course, this is uh, I'm going to be still be concentrating to uh, on the U.S. gutter gastro jejunostomy. Uh, because this is the most uh, uh, common procedure amongst uh, all these uh, different types of gastroenterosomy. So um, when we are dealing with the malignant gastrointestinal obstruction, uh, as you all know, uh, we have several, uh, uh, several options. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, of course, we know that we can deal with this with a duodenal stent. Uh, the other traditional way is uh, performing a surgical gastroenterostomy. And recently, um, we are now able to do gastroenterostomy. So each technique has their pros and cons. For a duodenal stand, it's a simple, simple procedure. It's cheap, it can be under, under another sedation, but a major uh, drawback is the low patency rate. Um, the other option is a traditional option, the surgical gastrogenostomy. Uh, in principle, uh, because the GJ is uh, situated away from the tumor, so it is uh, believed to have a longer patency. Uh, problem with surgical GJ is that uh, it needs to be done under general anesthesia. It's a bit more expensive than the duodenal stent. The procedural time, I'm going to show you a video later on, uh, is uh, much, much uh, more longer than a US G GJ. Uh, and because uh, there are some surgical scars, in theory, there might be a longer recovery time. For gastro, US gastroenterostomy, uh, of course, um, the stand is placed away from the tumor. So in theory, the patency should be longer than the duodenal stand. 
we are doing this now under IV sedation, but the major problem is we need um, a level of expertise. Also, um, there's always a risk of uh, adverse events which you may need to intervene. Again, this will need require a high level of exper expertise. And of course, Axios 10 is still quite expensive. So this adds to the cost of the procedure. So um, which one is uh, the winner? Uh, we need to think about all these different issues when consider considering the optimal uh, procedure for the patient. So um, laparoscopic uh, gastrojejunostomy. So this is after a distal gastrectomy. So this is a remnant stomach. First, we need to make a hole in the remnant stomach with a uh, ultrasonic dissector. Afterwards, we need to find a piece of small bowel. Again, we make a hole right here. Because nowadays we are usually performing a stapled uh, gastrojejunostomy. Then we insert a stapler. One end of the jaw is in the small bowel. And then the other jaw is inserted into the remnant stomach. And then we close the staple. We perform the uh, anastomosis. There's a still an enterotomy right here. So we need to suture this bit, which adds to another 15, 20 minutes to the whole procedure. So usually uh, this will take around half an hour or 45 minutes. Um, but uh, I can tell you um, this is uh, much more time consuming than the US procedure. So after the uh, suturing, the completed anastomosis will look like something like this. So um, on uh, another patient, uh, this is a B2 uh, reconstruction, B2. So remnant stomach, small bowel, and uh, anastomosis right here. So this looks like the picture that you see in a textbook, something like this. This one is not a human. This is a pig, and it's actually a gastro uh, jejunostomy uh, uh, performed by US. So uh, this was um, uh, when we start, started the procedure, before we started the procedure a few years ago, we did some uh, experiments in pigs, and this is by 20 millimeter axios. You can see the anastomosis is very clean. There's minimal adhesions between the two organs. And when you cut open, open the specimen, there's a very nice union between the two structures. So this is a US appearance of a US procedure. So you need to know that uh, when we perform a US procedure, it's slightly different than from a surgical gastrojejunostomy. Surgical gastrojej is between the stomach and the proximal jejunum. But in the US procedure, very often we are actually doing a gastroduodenostomy. Or because the stent is placed at the D3-4 level, so this is right at the angle of the DJ. And uh, this is uh, maybe uh, more properly called a gastroduodenostomy. So it's slightly different than, uh, from the uh, uh, traditional gastroduodenostomy. Um, the duodenal stents have been around for quite some time now, but uh, there has also been some advancement. So um, this is going to make complicate the, the picture a little bit more. Uh, there are some new stents which are covered, partially covered, duodenal stents. So you can see part of these stents are uncovered and in the middle is covered. So it, it works just like any of our esophageal stents uh, where the covered portion is at the tumor level. And then again, this covered portion can theoretically reduce the chance of uh, tumor in growth. So another thing that I want to point to you before I tell you which procedure is better is um, as we do more and more of these, these US um, drainage procedures, um, gastrodudinostomy, um, I become uh, more aware of the anatomy of the duodenum. So this is the typical picture 
of uh, what you see in the, in the textbook. So this is a usual C curve, uh, followed by the DJ flexion right here. But uh, as you do more and more of these procedures, actually you see that the anatomy is not always like this. There are actually many variations in the DJ flexion. So this is a normal position, which is a C curve. But there are also some partial rotation like this, some non-rotation of the duodenum where the, the small bowel is uh, located on the right side. There's also a corkscrew shaped duodenum, some partial duodenum uh, uh, rotation or a very redundant duodenum, which I've also seen. So you can see loops of uh, duodenum uh, going around before coming back to the DJ. So you need to be aware that um, there are quite a bit of variations uh, of uh, the DJ flexure uh, because um, um, when you perform the ES procedures, uh, you need to be aware that sometimes uh, the, uh, the location of the duodenum, duodenum that you are puncturing and how uh, these variations may affect your decision in which part of the duodenum to puncture. So uh, I'm going to give you two, two uh, CT films of uh, two patients. So I just want to illustrate that although the procedural aspects are very important, um, the patient uh, characteristic is also very important and it may affect your decision on where to, uh, which procedure to, to perform. So this is a patient with a metastatic re renal cell carcinoma. You can see the center stomach. But right here, there's a big metastasis. So right at the D3, 4, DJ level. So this is gonna be blocking your view of the small bowel. Um, you can, um, for these patients, uh, you can try to um, uh, perform a US procedure, but um, you should also have a second bell procedure. You should have a plan B. So in these patients, um, in, I would, want you to think about which procedure may be more, more useful for the patient, uh, and more applicable for the patient. And maybe, for, ex so for example, you should need to think, of bowel, think about bowel procedures like stenting versus left GJ. So in another patient, you can see a huge tumor over the right side of the abdomen. So again, with this sort of characteristics, um, it will affect your decision because uh, if you put a, for example, you place a duodenal stent, very likely the stent won't open in such a big tumor, uh, especially it's, if it's going through a curve. So again, uh, this patient character, this sort of patients, uh, you would decide uh, against stenting and more inclined to perform a gastroenterostomy, whether by US or laparoscopic approach. How about this patient? So what is, the abnormality in this patient. So this, you can see a distended stomach. So when I first saw the CT, I thought, I thought this uh, was a bit weird because you see all the small bowel was on the right side of the patient. And if you do a um, uh, axial uh, cut, you can see all the small bowel is on the right side of the patient. So this is actually a patient with a malrotated small bowel. Um, he was, uh, not uh, having any symptoms from this marrow rotation and it lived for years until he'd get this tumor. So again, with this sort of patient, would you perform a U.S. gastroenterostomy or other types of procedures? So um, I think we all know that duodenum has been around for a long time. Uh, there has been many studies uh, comparing uh, duodenal stent versus uh, surgical GJ. Uh, one meta-analysis, which was quite some time ago, almost 20 years, uh, showed that uh, um, had data on one RCT in eight comparative studies, and they showed that the endoscopic stenting was associated with higher clinical success, shorter time to oral intake, less morbidity, and less incidence of delayed gastric emptying. But they didn't uh, ish address the, main, uh, the most important issue, which is the re uh, rate of re intervention, readmission, and also patency. And um, after that, uh, and um, this also, this uh, meta-analysis also suggested uh, perhaps GJ uh, should be performed in surgically fit patients because uh, the patency may be longer or, or it can be performed as part of a staging procedure, staging laparoscopy procedure. And after this meta-analysis, there are several uh, randomized trials 
But unfortunately, all these trials, very small sample size, nine patients, 12 patients, 20 patients. Technical clinical success rate were similar. And uh, in terms of adverse events, some call, uh, showed uh, equal adverse events, some showed surgery to be worse. Another study showing that the stenting group had uh, more adverse events. So all these randomized trials failed to understand which is a better procedure. Um, during my preparation for this talk, I also came across this very interesting study from our Japanese uh, friends. Um, even with the Udino stents, um, the type of the Udino stent also affect um, the patency. So they compared the Warflex stent, which is known to have a high axial force, axial force versus the Nitya stent, which is a low axial, axial force Udino stent. Um, this is what was not a big st uh, study, randomized trial for of uh, 38 patients. They managed to show that with the Warflex, which has a high axial force, the rate of re reobstruction is actually much higher. So even within the Odino sense, the type of event will affect the uh, patency rate. And um, this is one thing that you also need to consider when doing a uh, stenting. So this is the uh, patency curve showing that the, with a low axial force stent like the NITS had a much better patency. This is uh, again uh, a more recent study uh, from our Japanese friends from Kitano Sensei. Um, this is a randomized trial of a newer type of stent which is a partially covered stent versus an uncovered stent uh, for uh, malignant stress other obstruction. So in theory, with a partially covered stent, um, again, it can prevent tumor in growth. So uh, in theory, the, uh, it may be associated with better patency rate. So this uh, study was presented by uh, Kitano Sensei in DDW uh, oral presentation last year. And I know that uh, with personal communication, he has been is submitting this paper to a big journal. But uh, so th these are the two types of stent. One is an uncovered deodorant stent. The other is a partially covered deodorant stent. It's a big study, 184 patients in a cover arm, 182 patients in the partially covered stent arm. Interestingly, so they show that the uncovered deodorant stent actually has a higher patency rate as, as, uh, 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 as shown by this curve. There's a longer time to uh, stent dysfunction in the uncovered stent arm. And uh, this is particularly true in patients with extrinsic tumor, uh, where the uncovered stent has had a longer time to stent dysfunction. So um, with personal communication with Kitano, um, he mentioned that they, uh, in patients with extrinsic tumor, actually the cover stent is a, hub, is a higher rate of uh, stent migration. So this is kind of uh, expected uh, because in patients with extrinsic, extrinsic tumor, there's no uh, tumor actually inside the lumen uh, to hold on to the stent. So um, the stent migration is, is uh, significant, significantly higher. So the difference in time to dysfunction is not different in patients with intrinsic tumor. So meaning that even with a partially covered stent in patients with primary um, uh, malignant gastric obstruction, perhaps the stent doesn't prevent uh, tumor in growth. So uh, their summary is that the time to stent dysfunction was longer in uncovered stent group in all patients, as well as those with extrinsic tumor. And uh, we are also uh, performing a similar study comparing these two types of stent in uh, patients, particularly for, uh, with uh, intrinsic tumor. So going back to our patient uh, with a uh, malrotation. So you see all these small over here. So which procedure would you, would you perform? So luckily uh, we have the double balloon device, uh, Itoi Sensei's device. So even with the small bar located in the right side of the uh, abdomen, we thought we could uh, have a try to see if we could perform a gastroenterostomy. Uh, uh, of course, uh, with a, a typical uh, anatomy, um, the procedure is, uh, uh, is uh, more difficult. 
you need to spend more time in trying to find the location of the puncture. Um, our gastro uh, duodenostomy was located at the antrum because all the small bowel is in the right side. And uh, we did um, use, uh, spend some time to try for, for the, to look for the best location. And in this patient, it was particularly useful because um, we had the double balloon device and we could really um, sit back, relax, and uh, use our time to find the most suitable punct uh, puncture point. So uh, passage of the double balloon device is just the same. This is the obstructive site. And on guide wire, we pass the uh, double balloon device to the uh, proximal jejunum. And afterwards, uh, we distend uh, both uh, balloons, just like uh, Itoi teaches us, the way Itoi teaches us. One balloon is here, the other balloon is here, and we distend this part of the uh, jejunum. So these are the two balloons. And I was happy because I had all this small bowel in between uh, to, uh, as, a, as a potential target for puncturing. So my stomach is right here, and my puncture site is probably somewhere around here. So after the two balloons are distended, we inject a uh, solution in between the two balloons. You can see my scope position is uh, a, a bit unusual. It's almost at the entro, but I was able to find a, a piece of uh, jejunum in a very nice position, longitudinal uh, window. And um, after uh, puncture, easy deployment, no sweat uh, in deploying this tent. So in terms of outcomes of uh, different studies, um, I think all of the giants are here, except uh, Christopher Thompson. Uh, Moen Kishab uh, first um, um, presented his results comparing U.S. gastroenterostomy versus duodenal stent. The technical success is a bit lower uh, in the U.S. arm, uh, probably because we are all at that time still in our learning curve. Uh, clinical success is higher in the U.S. arm, adverse events comparable. Re-interventions is significantly more in the duodenal stenting group. Um, Manolo. Um, present, uh, published this other study comparing U.S. versus laparoscopic GJ. Again, the technical success is slightly lower. Again, uh, I think it's uh, because uh, we were still at the learning, learning curve. Clinical success is a bit lower, again, because uh, maybe related to the technical success rate. Adverse events rate is significantly higher with the uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, gastrojejunosomy. Uh, with Christopher Thompson's group, uh, again, comparing stenting versus uh, gastroenterostomy, technical success, clinical success is, uh, uh, technical success is 100% in both. Clinical success is really higher with a gastroenterostomy. Adverse events rate lower with uh, US, and re-interventions is again lower with re-interventions. Uh, so suggesting that the US gastroenterostomy may be associated with better clinical success, less adverse events and also lower re-intervention. So we are now uh, performing uh, this uh, randomized trial. Um, because of COVID, uh, we haven't started uh, being able to uh, uh, properly uh, recruit patients, but hopefully, ho hopefully with um, the easing of the infection around the world, uh, we can all join hands and perform uh, this randomized trial together. Another thing that I want to just um, shortly mentioned about is, uh, in the past, we had a lot of discussion about concomitant biliary obstruction. Uh, we know that there are different types, type one, type two, type three, and there were a lot of discussions on how to tackle this uh, situation, whether to stand the duodenum first or stand the biliary ducts first, uh, and uh, even and, uh, how, what is the technique of cannulation if there's a duodenal stand present. And with published studies, um, there are uh, various uh, rates of technical success being described. But with US procedure, nowadays we can perform both procedures at the same time. Again, Moeen uh, published this small study in seven patients uh, in which um, both, uh, all patients had a gastroenterostomy and BD done at the same time. And I think uh, this is a very nice indication. So because um, with US, um, it really doesn't matter with where, whether we stent the uh, duodenum first 
uh, and we perform a gastroenterostomy first or a, perform a biliary drainage. And with biliary drainage, we can also have choice between CDS versus XGS. So uh, with US, it really opens up our option in these difficult uh, patients. So in this patient, uh, again, uh, this was done by Itoi in our workshop uh, many years ago. He first performed a gastroenterostomy in this patient, followed by a mark. This is the usual gastroenterostomy. And then afterwards, Mark Giovannini performed a hepatogastrostomy uh, in the same session in this patient. So again, showing you, um, it's a very nice uh, way to uh, deal with the patient with a double obstruction. And um, it, with the US procedure, it really opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of uh, along, uh, treating these patients. So, a US guided double bypass is now a uh, possibility. So in conclusion, I, um, the optimal technique of US guided gastroenterostomy is still in evolution. Um, there are some data uh, suggesting a US guided gastroenterostomy uh, may be uh, superior in terms of the many outcomes. Uh, but I think we still need a standardization of the technique because um, we want this procedure to be very safe and we want it to be able to be done by even our um, least uh, experienced uh, colleagues. Uh, because with duodenal stent, uh, it's a very easy procedure. It's, it's a very safe procedure. Uh, it's also cheaper. So we want, really want the US procedure to be uh, equally um, uh, similar in terms of these basic issues. So for USG to be pop popular, we need to overcome issues in cost and also expertise uh, in the future. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anthony. Um, wonderful summary of the uh, current uh, opinion and the literature and also some very, very wonderful videos. Uh, we are running about 15 minutes uh, late. Uh, so if Manolo is ready uh, with the live case, otherwise we can take a few questions. Uh, Manolo, are you ready? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay, here muted is mic. Manolo, yes, okay, Manolo, let's take some questions. Ready. You're ready? Hello. Yeah, hi, 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 hi. Let's start. So... Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I yes. I have a microphone. The volume so, is very low. That's because of COVID. <laughs> Can you so turn I'll, up the volume? I have to shout or maybe I'll have to put my mic inside the mask. Oh. <laughs> Can you hear me better now? Yes. Maybe I should put the mic into my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, um, what's the case? Uh, uh, this is uh, a young lady with an uncinate uh, neoplasm, unresectable, um, and she just had US FNA done by my partner Carlos de la Serna. And he, he's uh, behind the, the eye shield. Is with gastric outlet obstruction, despite having had an NG tube overnight, she still had a lot of uh, fluid content, and uh, uh, unluckily for us and for herself, of course, the stricture is located in the third duodenum. If you remember what we discussed during the talk earlier, the third duodenum is the most difficult location for the guy where to go through, even if he's one of the least common. It is precisely in uncinate neoplasms that uh, uh, cause third duodenal strictures. Now I'm gonna start with a side viewing, with a side viewing scope. Uh, 
So please give uh, give all of your staff a big thanks for staying late on our behalf. I know it's a Friday evening. Anolo. So we are with the side view and scope. Can you? Oh, okay. We, you have the floor, uh, the room uh, image. We're gonna switch to Endo. So you see a lot of fluid, uh, a lot of bile, retained content in the stomach despite the NG suction. Can you see the endoscopy now? Yes. Okay. So as I said, I'm with a uh, duodenoscope through the pylorus. Okay, so this is at the apex. It's not so bad. It is not so bad. At the apex, I can go through. And then the real one, the real picture is here, right distal to the papilla. Let's try our luck with an oasis, 8.5. And uh, the beauty of this catheter is that the pushing segment of the catheter is eight French, but it has a very soft tip and it has radio opaque marker. So let's see if we can make a Jaguar go through. I have a very good tactile feedback. My catheter is going nicely. I think we got lucky this time. The catheter got through. Now, we put some saline into the catheter. We're go zoom uno. We're gonna zoom in with the fluoro un poquito vertical hacia mí. No, no. Ahora después. Uh, maybe you can take a look at the at the fluoro. See no. how we manipulate the guy. Well, no. Oblicuo un poquitín a la derecha, por favor. Remember the tip of my side viewing uh, endoscope is in the distal second duodenum, facing the beginning of the third duodenum, Metegia. We need plural pictures, Manolo. Okay, Ramon is working on that. Okay. This is everything, the IT is okay. homemade. I know, I know. <laughs> Great and effort, thank you. Indians. We are not Indians, so gastroenterologists <laughs> is saying, do not no. have an IT Great effort, around. great effort. <laughs> Do you get the floor or now? Yes, yes. fantastic. So my view. Almudena, in my right hand side, is pushing the guide wire. I got, and you see what's happening with the guide wire? It's taking loops, but not yes. moving farther deep. So what I'm going to do now is push, empuja, at the same time that she pushes, try to loop this oasis catheter, empuja, fuerte. Okay, we're not, it's not happening. I'm pulling back. Retira la guía, retira, mira la escopia. Okay, and I'm trying to, empuja, yeah. Okay, very easy. Now the guide wire is going forward. And you see, I'm pushing, I'm pushing the catheter. I'm past the trites now. I see some contrast. I don't know if this is from uh, exam at the referring hospital. Uh, I don't know. I would like to ask now, Takao and Anthony, is this deep enough for you? Puedes mover un poquito de lado. Looks nice. Uh, beyond the ligament of the right, so lady. Yeah, looks like. Okay. I can we exchange now? We hacemos intercambio. We remove the catheter. El drenaje no biliar preparado y purgado. And we're gonna use. Uh, so I'm not using fluoro. I will for you. 
So I have a long distance of catheter. You see the papilla, the patient uh, is not jaundiced as, as far as I know. So uh, Dr. De La Serna, my partner, Carlos De La Serna confirms that the patient is not jaundiced. This is just a presentation with gastric outlet obstruction. And uh, in case she has uh, developed uh, symptomatic uh, biliary obstruction, you see ERCP is perfectly doable in this, in this patient. That's the papilla. And the stricture is distal to the papilla. A case might be made for EOS guided biliary drainage as patients with uh, synchronous biliary and duodenal obstruction as ha ha have a higher likelihood of biliary stent dysfunction if drainage is done transpapillary. Okay. So are you, do you see the endoscopy now? Yes. 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 Are you That's endoscopy perfect. or fluoroscopy? Now this is endoscopy, just to give you a brief glimpse of the 8.5 nasobiliary drain catheter. You see this is uh, 8.5. Um, uh, my assistant is putting some traction on the wire. Uh, I'm gonna give you the floor of you now. Yes. So the catheter is moving nicely. Tira de la guía, tira más, tira más, tira más, tira más, tira más, tira más, tira fuerte, tira más fuerte. Okay, I think that's that's okay. I'm gonna remove the the echo endoscope. The, sorry, the duodenoscope. Leaving the guide wire, quitanos un poquito de zoom. I'm going to leave the um, floral room, floral show. No. Mueve un poquito vertical hacia ti. Alguien que recoja la cabecera. Sigue, sigue. So, now we exchange the echo endoscope for the, for the, uh, sorry, the duodenoscope for the echo endoscope. Maybe you want, this is relatively easy, but maybe we can have a room a view now. In plural, we are okay. This is what you see. We leave the guide wire in, in place until we remove the echo, the duodenoscope. Now, Ramon, mostramos la, 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 el ambiente. So, we have to exchange scopes and in the meantime we will show you how we handle this so now we remove the guide wire we put the cap back on on the nasobiliary drain I use fluoro that that you cannot see, and the uh, nasobiliary drink stays in place. As I said, uh, the, the real name for this would be orojejunal uh, catheter, because this is not draining anything. And uh, the time th that we have here now, spending in exchanging scopes, we could have saved if the stricture would have been in the first duodenum. Uh, now, Almudena, my assistant, can we have some Zoom here, Ramon? No, no Zoom, so this is low-cost transmission, sorry. Basically, we are putting the cap back on the nasobiliary drain and then connecting to the pump. So we have a regular water pump and we start, uh, we start putting... Uh, 
I can I can start putting some water through the pump. Now uh, my assistant Almudena, she's holding the drain, the catheter, just to prevent looping into the stomach as I go alongside. I'm gonna put the end of you on the catheter. So I go alongside Ramon. We go back to endoscopy. So our IT guy is also on endoscopy. He is running around uh, the room very carefully. We don't see the endoscopy image. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Can you see the endoscopy? You see the drain in the esophagus, right? Yes. I'm going alongside. I'm using fluoro that, uh, that I cannot show you. No, espera, espera, tranquilo. So we have a little bit of looping here in the stomach. That was before I I I got, I removed the air. I, I apply suction. Uh, so I'm doing some suction, 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 suction. Before I I I'm, I'm moving towards the posterior uh, gastric body wall. Me podéis dar una mascarilla distinta. Y de las cirúrgicas. Esto porque no se ve el eco. I'm going to switch the ultrasound on. So, but, uh, I'm, I'm going to step on the pedal. Looking for the small bowel. Okay, give me. Me das un poco de tiempo, por favor. So, oh yeah, can you hear me better now? No. Por much better, much better, much better. Okay. Quita este otro. Eh, Ramón, fluoro now. La tienes. There is an echo. A lot of echo coming. So you see a lot of echoes, bright echoes. This is the small bowel. Right? And the idea is to remove that, hemos puesto buscapina, remove that air and fill the small bowel with... Uh, Show us an uh, endoscope image, echoendoscope image, US image. Uh, this is too much. We cannot. What do you want, Taka? US? Uh, no, yeah, yes. Yeah, now, so we can see uh, only a uh, fluoroscopic imaging. We cannot see both. I no. just wanted to show on the fluoro. Okay. Uh, the re repositioning of the drain. So I'm going to pull on the drain. You see on the fluoro? Yes. It's yes. straightening. I understand. You see the pigtail coming a little bit closer. The pigtail is there next to the echo endoscope. Now, when well, I press on the pump, I can see the vowel. Okay. I'm, I'm now we can, I can show the EOS. Pon, pon el, el, el eco. Do you see the EOS now? Yes. 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 Okay. Hopefully, there's still some air. Where I did not want it to be. We haven't been putting a lot of air. Okay, I'm looking the wrong way. I'm using the fluoro to adjust my position. Pregunta si 
ven bien la, el movimiento de la S. Que sí, que lo ven. Se ve aquí. Uh, I'm zooming in on the US. I don't know if you can see that. Um, yes. Apologize for the quality of the image. It's nice, very nice. Is it good? Okay. Manolo, Manolo. Yes. I guess a lot of water are going back to the stomach, right? That is true. Oh. That is true. Yeah, we have an issue with that. Let's see on endoscopy how it looks like. Let's put some air. We did have a lot of bile, if you remember. So the stomach does not have a lot of fluid inside, okay? Just this puddle. Here, so I'm going back to US. I'm uh, having a little bit difficulty in in finding the right uh, the right uh, loop of, of bowel. Okay, that's very nicely drainable, but it's not our target. So maybe it has something to do with what Anthony told uh, about the variations in the anatomy. So maybe we could use a little bit contrast. Now yes. there is some highly highlight. And again, as Takao said in his lecture, we wait patiently until we have a nice window. Vamos a poner, so we're gonna, we're gonna use a little bit of help uh, from x-ray. We're putting contrast through the nasobiliary drain and some methylene blue, contraste con azul. Si, si. So there is bowel there with air, but it is not nicely distended. So Manolo, so uh, what position are you having the patient? And uh, have you given the patient any buscopan? And how much have you- Patient injected? is left lateral semi-pro. Left lateral semi-pro. Almost on his belly. That might be one of the difficulties why the, contra the fluid is not staying. She's too flat on her belly. Okay. So probably a little is bit more sideways. Question, it's not Now we put some contrast, a methylene blue. Sigue, sigue. Now we're beginning to see some distinction. Mm. We had an issue, maybe kinking or maybe something, with the until the nurse Almudena injected and unblocked it. We we could not get any distinction. That was the reason why. Now she had to press very forcefully and we get this nicely distended segment of small power. Uh, we can go back to US. Vamos a, a... Very nice view. Now we have US. Un, el de 20, lo abrimos, lo mojamos. Vamos, ponemos la bomba. Esto es azul con contraste. So, we had one uh, little difficulty not very, you know, difficult to understand, but the nasobiliary drain was somehow blocked or king. While I was stepping on the pump pedal, no fluid was going into the small bowel. That's the reason why we couldn't get a target. Now that it is unblocked by the forceful injection done by Almudena, 
I have my target right in front of me. There are some bubbles. Okay. okay, some air is coming from the pump, so I'm not going to inject. My axios catheter is going. Takao, do you like the position this, this loop is standing at the moment? Not bad. Not bad. Mm. How do you like that one? Yeah, much better. Much better, okay. Uh, much better. My catheter is, is coming from the right side. I want to see the water boy. At the count of three, I'm gonna zoom in on the ultrasound. One, two, three. I want to see the water boil. Did you see the, the water boil or not? You saw yes. it, right? It was, so I know I'm deep in, I keep pushing, but without stepping on the cautery. I lock the gray button and then I'm ready to deploy. The flange is gonna come backwards towards me, but I'm deeply in. You see the flange? Now I'm pulling back to do intra-channel stem release. So I've done step number one, step number two. This pushback is step number three. Do you like it there, Takao, or is it okay? Yeah, okay, nice. Okay, so I lock and I'm ready to go step number four on the proximal flank. And then I will switch to endoscopy. So I deploy, you, the only thing you, you notice during step four is that the distal flange stays on target without moving. I've already deployed inside the channel and I'm gonna sh sh shift to end of view to show you step number five, which is basically pushing the proximal flange out from the scope working channel. For that, I unlock the lower button, and then I push the gray part of the catheter while my elevator is down, my insufflation is on, and my echo endoscope is being pulled backward. I'm pushing a black catheter, elevator down, pulling back, rotating, and then you see the methylene blue comes here. So there is no concern whatsoever of peritoneal misplacement for two reasons. First, we saw the distal uh, tip of the hot axis catheter boil the water in the jejunum. So we saw those bubbles. There's no missing. We saw under ultrasound the distal flange being deployed inside that loop. And third, we saw the methylene blue flowing backwards. If there's any doubt, you remember the gray color nasobiliary drain? Can you see at the bottom of my axial tip? So this is, uh, this is intraluminal. And uh, now to finish, before we conclude, maybe Ramon, we can show the x-ray. So I'm going to step on the fluoro. You see now contrast is flowing back into the stomach. This is um, painting the folds of the stomach. We can go back to endoscopy, Ramon. Vamos endoscopia. I'm going to pull out the nasobiliary drain catheter. You, you see the methylene blue here, proximal flange, and that's it. I don't know if there are any questions or comments or... Fantastic, very, very, very nice demonstration. Excellent, uh, Manolo. So we have a little bit of a stretcher here at the apex, yeah. but not terrible. And then we have another one, just distal to the papilla. 
Yes. In the third wall and on that, we could see much better with the side viewer, with a semi-oblique forward viewing of the echo endoscope, linear echo endoscope, it's a little bit more tangential. And as for the position of the axial stand in the stomach, you see it's lying uh, mid-body, body to uh, fundus junction, right? So it's yes. lying, you, this is the usual typical location. And we will let these 20 millimeter axis to expand gradually over the course of uh, a few hours. And we are, uh, we are, uh, we are done. So I'm going to remove the echo endoscope. Fantastic, fantastic. So uh, Manolo, there is a question. What is the advantage of an oasis over a Fogarty catheter? Can you what hear me? What is the advantage of an oasis versus Fogarty catheter for the advancing the wire? Catheter? Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe while they uh, move the patient in the room, I can take the microphone yes. uh, somewhere else so we have less background noise. Sure, sure, sure. And we don't interfere with the, the personnel, right? Yeah. Ramón, podemos llevarnos el micrófono a otro sitio para no molestar aquí. Sí, hemos terminado a la puerta. A la puerta. Vale, pues a la puerta. No, no mucho porque. Bueno, pues ya vamos a poner algo. ¿Te acabo? In the meanwhile, uh, there is a question: Do patients develop severe diarrhea and malnutrition post USGJ? Uh, I, I, I've never, I've never experienced that, uh, but. Uh, after injection, a lot of water was herring. So maybe it causes a severe diarrhea or something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Overhydration. Okay. Mm. There's a question for me. Have you done a benign case? Uh, <laughs> I have done one. It didn't go well. The patient came back pretty soon. Oh, really? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, then can we use a single balloon? Takao again. Instead of a two balloons, can we use a one balloon which occludes the lumen distally? Yeah. So as we, I experienced a single balloon, but uh, as I mentioned, some a lot of water easily go back uh, stomach, and uh, okay. not so fully occluded. Okay. You scared me, Takao, with the water. Yeah. <laughs> minimum minimum <laughs> amount of uh, uh, serine is much better for the patient. Just uh, okay. 100 cc or something. Sometimes uh, just okay. uh, ENBD tube uh, pumping or uh, needs a lot of water. Or... No, uh, the volume okay. that we need to inject is not so big. It's 200 cc. Mm -hmm. So, uh, currently, we are doing a prospective study of this uh, EUSGJ technique. We're measuring all the technical, like the volume that we inject, the time it takes for each step, if a trainee can do it, all of that. And this is a multi-center prospective uh, Spanish trial. So far, the mean volume is 200 cc. The problem so with our pump today it is because of this, you know, when you're doing things at a live demo, uh, you may not be paying attention to every step. Our catheter was king. I was stepping on the pump pedal, but the water was not going through into the small bowel. Then Dr. Itoi said, you have a lot of water in the stomach. And I said, oh, maybe my catheter slipped back into the stomach or something. Luckily, it wasn't like that. The, the, the stricture was very tight. Mm -hmm. So there was no reflux of uh, saline or methylene blue because we didn't see any methylene blue backward into the stomach until after the axis was open. So uh, all the fluid that we could see during the initial steps of the EUS was the bile that was originally already there when we started. But obviously the reflux of fluid into the stomach is a concern. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it is the gastric retained contents for this procedure. 
Manolo, uh, yeah. lateral position or prone position or supine position? We use semi-prone, left lateral semi-prone. So, like the okay. old ERCP, the left arm is on the patient's back and the patient is a little bit okay. prone, but not fully flat on their bellies. It's a You're getting a lot of congratulations on uh, a fantastic demonstration. Lots of congratulations uh, are coming as comments. Very, very nice. Thank you. We, we, we appreciate so that from, uh, from Valladolid and all the team that stay, uh, stayed on on a Friday afternoon after hours. As I said, Vinay, they're all very happy, provided they are invited to go to Mumbai for next Please come, um, please come. <laughs> the nurses all too. <laughs> I want one interesting question I want all of you to answer before we go. Diabetic gastroparesis, is it a good indication? Let's start with Moin. Moin? Uh, no, no gastroparesis is a good indication. Please do not do this, this procedure no. for gastroparesis. So surgical GJ, or any type of stent, it's, it's, it's not, gastroparesis is, uh, is a very complex entity. You know, it's, it's not just a purely emptying entity. There is, an, uh, there, is part of, there is a subset of gastroparetic patients whose pyloro spasm is, uh, is a major uh, component. Uh, and, and some of these patients may respond to a surgical procedure like pyloroplasty or GPOM. Maybe a GJ will benefit some of these patients, but we don't have a way to diagnose pyloric spasm. So at this time, a GJ is not, should not be considered for gastroparesis. Okay. Any, any, any other opinion? Manolo, you agree? Uh, we, we, uh, we don't have a lot of experience in gastroparesis. Moeen has plenty of experience. I know that uh, uh, Michel Barthé has been doing some animal lab experiments on diabetes and gastric emptying. Okay. So he hmm. and I would probably agree with Moeen, if you do that, do it on a pig. Don't do it on a human. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anthony, uh, is ascites a contraindication? What? Is ascites, ascites. a contraindication? Uh, I think it depends on how, uh, how bad the patient has ascites, would you do a GJ? So it depends on the quantity. So if there's a lot of ascites, then um, I would tend to drain them first uh, because um, there's a risk of infecting the acidic fluid. Uh, if it's not a lot, uh, if, you can, if it's not in the way of the US, uh, um, then uh, I think with a small amount of ascites is still okay. So, is Vinay, there a Vinay of, I have a uh, question for, for yeah, Anthony. Yeah, Manolo. Anthony, okay. what is that? is that? Is that the panic room in your house? Or where are you, Anthony? <laughs> I'm in my room that my son studies and does the homework. <laughs> it's a kid proof, uh, it's a kid -proof uh, room, right? <laughs> yeah. well, sleeping last, 11. La last question before we go. We are really late. You have to go, you guys. The cow, it's very late in the evening, I know there. Uh, is there a risk of bleeding secondary to lambs? If yes, what is the percentage? I mean, for GJ, I guess that is the question. So basically, uh, my, in my personal experience, uh, zero. So uh, unless we dilate the uh, uh, stent immediately after placement, maybe no such kind of no uh, severe bleeding. Okay. Otherwise, uh, of course, uh, the usually so we have to check the intervening blood vessel before uh, performing this procedure. If so, okay. no problem. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we have had a fantastic three and a half hours uh, discussion on EOSCJ. That's quite uh, comprehensive. Thanks, all of you, Manolo, uh, Takao, Anthony, Moin. Um, 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 thank, thank you for, for sparing the time. The situation was almost 800. Uh, so that is very, very good. 52 countries. So I think um, the next uh, webinar will be done by Anthony. Um, so all, all of you who are uh, there, please, please, please attend the next one.
big thanks to Olympus, big thanks to Boston Scientific, big thanks to Jason, Flora, Arun, Olympus guys. Great work, fantastic work and big thanks to Manolo's team uh, who made the live possible despite difficulties. Great job, great job. Thank you very much. The nurses Thank there. Um, let's, let's hope we meet soon and these things get over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations, Vinay. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Vinay. Congrats, congrats. The next uh, webinar by uh, EEG will be on USB drainage. It's on the 11th of July. So uh, some of you will be uh, faculties to that uh, workshop as well. So uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thank Thanks, you. Lazaro. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Good night. Good night. Thank you for the invitation, Good please. Night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Lazaro. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Dixon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Flora, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. I'm going to wait to you later. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 -bye. Oh, they are more mad you for. Oh, Aaron, thanks for joining. Thank you so much. Let's have a good rest today. <laughs>